Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Am I audible? I believe I am. Hi, Victor. Hello. So, uh, again, thanks everybody for joining us for this response to the second part of Keith Wood's video series entitled Why I'm Not a Marxist. Uh, this one concerned with critiquing the labor theory of value. That's Keith's video. Um, this is, of course, the second such response by this channel. Um, I have already critiqued his first episode on the supposed incoherence of Marxist ethics, which, since it still stands unanswered, I will take to have been conceded to by Keith. Um, but for this episode, I am joined again by Victor, to whom I will be turning over uh, in all likelihood most of the following, as he is the expert among us and will easily make me out to be a fool as easily as he will the authors of what we are going to be responding to here, minus a point or two that are so obviously fraught that it's going to be even obvious to me. However, before we get into it, um, I do have some short words about this project Keith is embarking upon as a whole, um, which are frankly not flattering to his intentions or to his honesty, but I want to get the NVIDIA stuff out of the way so we can just focus on the arguments. You know me, I kind of have to do this. So the major observation is that this project is inherently and absolutely unproductive. It presents no new information and indeed fails spectacularly even to present old information accurately. Now, Keith has some level of pride in his image as a thinking individual. He has, after all, chosen to make a channel concerned with hard intellectual material. Nonetheless, he is eager for attention and praise and thus seems to have allowed his standards to sink where the consequences of upholding them would mean deferring the rewards for producing content that frankly appeals to the taste of a very low quality of audience. I am therefore extremely grateful for the very high quality of mine. This is good for business, but not for credibility. In the first video, as I point out in my first response, Keith was incapable of accurately reproducing an argument of Marx or of major Marxists in context, and ultimately had to rely, for instance, on the moral feeling evoked by certain sentences to substantiate a contradiction in the general sense of uh, sorry, <laughs> to evoke a moral feeling evoked by certain sentences, uh, you know, the, to substantiate a contradiction in the general sense of Marxists and Hegelians that morality is determined by social unit of which one is a part. I have no idea what the hell I wrote there, so I'm just going to move on. Um, long story short, the, the question that I will otherwise be forced to ask over and over again if I don't give this stupid preamble at the beginning is why on earth is Keith making this video about the labor theory of value at all? He clearly hasn't done his research. Um, he didn't do his research for the first part and he's outsourced most of the research to the terminally online Lord Keynes. And as far as I can tell, the only reason um, is that he's trying to get his share of the same worm-ridden slop snorted into by the likes of Dennis Prager and Charlie Kirk, which I think is frankly beneath him. Now, this bears not an iota on the validity of the arguments we're going to go into. I mean only to point out before we go into this that these are not, properly speaking, going to be arguments by Keith. They assume the form of statements and answers to questions, sure, but they don't emanate from or respond to any one person's reasons or experience, but rather to the emotional needs of an amorphous mass of frankly scared, angry, and ignorant people hungry for their fear and rage to be represented in the world in some way anyway and from whom Keith can extract, ultimately, money. And I think the fact that of this is to his shame, and the fact that Lord Keynes would stoop to assisting it is equally disgraceful, if not more so. An older, much more educated man using, as far as I'm concerned, a kid as a front because he's too much of a coward to put his work to his own face. Great, that's out of the way. No more invidious stuff. We can focus purely on the argument. So if you're ready to go, Victor, unless you had anything you wanted to say before we begin, we can get right into it. Yes, I'm just going to say that uh, it is a true pleasure for me to be here once again uh, with you and your audience. And uh, let me just say from the beginning that I think that, you know, this video uh, markets itself as being, as it were, a uh, improvement over the very, you know, uh, silly criticisms that we hear all the time from the labor, uh, from the part of the people that uh, are not in agreement with the labor theory of value. So they present themselves as, you know, Lord Keynes and, and Keith here present themselves as being, you know, more intellectual and actually presenting academic, you know, uh, in academically informed criticisms against the labor theory of value. But in, in reality, and this is something that I'm going to be showing uh, through all of the video today, is that what they're doing here is just staying at the level of memes once again. 
you know, maybe they are a little bit more specific memes and they are certainly going to motivate a very technical discussion of certain topics uh, that I have some things prepared for. But this is nevertheless just staying at the level of pure memes. And I have identified, okay, uh, and you can see this yourself when you're when we're going through the video, four very prominent memes that they're going to be, you know, presenting here as, as uh, attempted refutation of, of the labor theory of value. And we have uh, to begin with the one that is going to appear at the end of the video, which is that Marx doesn't explain or that it's actually a non sequitur, his argument for why there is a reduction to a social, to a common substance of uh, exchange values. Okay, so exchange values get reduced to a social, con uh, to a social uh, let's say, substance. And they are going to say that Marx doesn't explain why this is the case, how it occurs. They're going to say that it is a non sequitur to say that because two things are commensurable in the market, that there therefore has to be a third thing to which they are reduced. Okay. Now, this is something that Marx, of course, explains, but this is nevertheless a meme, okay, that is shared, uh, that, that has roots in the Austrian School of Economics. And then we have the very prominent meme of the contradiction between volumes one and three of Das Kapital, which is not a contradiction. I'm going to be explaining why this is not a contradiction, why they don't understand what contradictions are, and why they don't understand what scientific, uh, you know, what the scientific procedure in, in, in the development of a theory is uh, within a, a scientific piece of work, okay? So they clearly don't understand that either. And then they also have the meme that Marx believed, okay, in this, a Smithian concept of the root and early state of society. Now, I already explained uh, President Sunday in a private conversation that we had why this is not the case, why actually Marx didn't believe this to be an actual state of society. But yet, um, Keith is going to, and, and Lord Keynes, who is informing Keith, is going to say basically that, no, 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 Marx believed this, just as Adam Smith, and that this is wrong because there's no anthropological data to show that this was actually a, an existing period of history where this particular phenomena occurred. Okay, Marx never believed that. This is just a meme. And once again, we have the fourth meme, which is the very classic one. Marx died without knowing, sorry, without finishing his work because he knew that he had failed in his attempt to support the, the labor theory of value, and he just let himself die, as it were, you know. He let himself die without actually addressing the, 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 the very important problem that they're going to point out here, which is the, the transformation problem, okay? And he promised that there was going to be a solution, but then he died, so he was saved, as it were, from having to present a solution, but then uh, Engels realized that this was the case, that Marx didn't never solve this problem. So then he was forced, in a sense, to present, you know, a little bit here and there to try to, you know, make it seem like this was actually solved. But in reality, Engels didn't do anything either. So I'm going to be arguing that this is also a meme. It is a very prominent meme. And uh, Marx actually knew the procedure of the transformation, you know, the transformation procedure. He already told us how we should go about doing it, okay? And he never went about doing it because volumes two and three are based on his notes, not on what he actually, you know, intended those two volumes to be. And they are volumes of the same book. They are not different books. They're volumes of the same book, okay? So we need to understand also what scientific progression within a piece of scientific literature is. And that's one, what I'm going to be explaining here. So let's uh, let's go into it. And uh, let me know in the audience if you can't hear this for whatever reason. I do like that beat, though. The labor theory of value is the foundation upon which Marxist economics must be understood. It's hard to understate how important labor theory of value is for the whole Marxist system, as it is the basis on which Marxists claim that workers are exploited by capitalism. Since labor is the source of value, and workers work more time than what is needed for their own reproduction, employers only profit by extracting a surplus of their employees' labor time, and this is the supposed basis for exploitation. Not only this, but labor theory of value, or LTV, allows Marx to understand the ecosystem of capitalism, and as such it is the basis for Marx's key predictions about the future development of capitalism. 
such as the falling rate of profit and the eventual collapse of the capitalist system itself. One thing that is striking about reading Marxists discussing the labour theory of value is just how much disagreement there is about what it actually infers or what Marx himself actually believes about LTV. For example, my own personal favourite Marxist thinker, the economist David Harvey, has written an essay titled Marx's Refusal yeah, can we stop of it right here? Theory of Value. So David Harvey is not an economist. He's a geographer. Okay. And he's certainly a person that I've learned a lot from, and he's certainly an authority on this capital. But uh, there is, and, and it's also the case that there is disagreement upon Marxists, uh, between Marxists, on the issue of what the labor theory of value really entails, okay, on certain specific parts of uh, Marx's own understanding of the theory and so on and so forth. But this doesn't mean that there are no good, you know, interpretations of this theory, that there are no good developments of this theory and that there aren't, you know, indeed solid foundations that this theory is based upon, okay? Now, that is something that they almost, you know, hint at, but they don't want to make this case, but they're hinting at that because otherwise they wouldn't be presenting this piece of information, okay? But it is true that there is some disagreement among, among Marxists on certain technical issues, but what is not true is that this, uh, in a sense, implies that the theory has no roots, that it, that it that is just, you know, an amorphous entity, okay? This is not the case. And also, David Harvey is, again, a person that I, that I, that I have in high esteem, but uh, I think that his uh, very, you know, uh, let's say unfortunate article on, uh, which was a very short piece of, you know, of writing that wasn't an academic uh, peer-reviewed article, okay? His short essay on why Marx didn't have a labor theory of value was incorrect, okay? Paul Cockshot pointed this out, and there's no big deal to be made out of this, okay? Everyone makes mistakes at times. But, you know, uh, there's no need to present this as, you know, otherwise, if you're just trying to, in a sense, poison the well. And that's mm. what I think this is trying to be done here. Now, Harvey claims that Marx did not, in fact, declare his allegiance to LTV and that LTV, as used by most Marxists, is bad economics. This sparked a number of responses from other Marxist academics who insisted it was Harvey who had the wrong understanding of Marx. Now, for such an apparently simple formula, why should there be so much disagreement after all this time? What is little discussed is that Marx actually formulated two contradictory versions of LTV, one in Volume 1 of Capital and one in Volume 3. In Volume 1 of Capital, Marx defended in his text a law of value, this is the term he uses for LTV, in which homogeneous socially necessary labor time units were the anchor for the price system in modern capitalism. This is the conventional formulation of the labor theory of value. And it is to say that individual commodity prices are supposed to gravitate towards their labor values. Prices can deviate from labor values. It doesn't determine all prices, but they do get driven back to the true labor value in a quasi-equilibrium process. Now, in volume three, this is actually abandoned. Instead, prices of production determine prices, and most individual prices deviate from true labor values. So the law of value now only indirectly explains prices. In summing up Marx's pivot in volume three, the economist Alexander Gray wrote, quote, things exchange according to their costs of production, which includes a normal rate of profit. It is true that they still have a value which differs in general from the price, but in a value which is an abstract metaphysical conception and which is uniformly ignored in the marketplace, few of us have any lively interest. Marx also seemed to claim elsewhere that the labor theory of value was applicable up until a certain stage in the development. Okay, can we capital. stop it right here be yeah. before we go to that part? Okay. Yeah. So we have encountered the second meme. So the one of the prominent memes of this video, which is the famous so-called contradiction between volume one and volume three. Now, the way in which this was explained was really, you know, uh, simplified. Okay. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to explain it in more detail. And I'm going to explain through, you know, this uh, presentation also why this is not a contradiction. But before we need to understand that what a contradiction is, okay, in an argument is an instance, okay, formally, where two premises, 
okay, of the same argument are in strict, okay, logical uh, contra disagreement with each other, okay? So there is a direct negation of a premise by a latter premise. That is what a contradiction is. Or there is an implication of a direct negation by a latter premise of an earlier premise, okay? Of an argument. Now, this is not the case in Marx, okay? And I'm going to present a very nice example to see, to show why this is not going to be the case in Marx, okay? So let's take the case of the theory of gravity, okay? Of the basic Newtonian conception of gravity. So Newton already knew, okay, that in a vacuum, okay, before he introduced, you know, air, before he introduced fluids through which objects, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, you know, move, okay? Before he introduced any of those, you know, concrete factors, he talked about the theory in a more abstract sense, which was the sense of, if we abstract from all of these factors, two objects, regardless of their mass, should fall at the same speed, okay? When falling, they should follow the same speed. Now, this is at a certain point of abstraction, correct. And indeed, we can show experiments where in a vacuum, objects fall at the same speed. Now, a person like Lord Keynes would come and say, no, 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 no. You know, Newton had a, a contradiction in his theory because then at the, at the beginning he was saying this, but then at the end, He's saying that, no, 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 it doesn't turn out to be the case. Objects do not fall at the same speed. Because when you throw out of a building, you know, let's say a, 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 a rock and a feather, they do not indeed fall at the same speed. So then for Lord Keynes, this would be a contradiction. But for a person that understands scientific development, they would see that this is not a contradiction. This is a specification of an aspect of the theory, which is, okay, at an abstract sense, okay, without including more concrete factors, like fluids, you know, like, like yeah. the fluid through which they are falling, through which these objects are falling, it is true that objects fall at the same speed. Now, if you include air or water, objects do not fall at the same speed anymore. But this is not a contradiction. This is just a specification of an earlier point that was made at a certain level of abstraction, of analytical abstraction. Now, this is the same case for Marx. And now I'm going to show you why. But if you want to make a point. Well, before, before we get further into it, for the other layman in the audience like myself, who I imagine is most of us, um, this strikes me as a little bit strange insofar as why at the concluding, well, not the concluding section, he of course planned it to be much longer than it was, but why two volumes ahead of the beginning of this monster would we expect to see just a pure restatement of the argument he was tortuously making in the first volume? It seems a little bit strange to me. Can you specify, like, maybe, um, because, of course, he's he's specifying the argument to, to conditions, not, as you say, in the vacuum. Do you know off the top of your head what those conditions are so we can just have, like, absolute clarity here? Or is that, it's, it's fine I'm, if you can't off the top of your head. No, no, I'm, I'm going to be explaining exactly what those conditions are. But I'm, I'm reading here in the comments, Lord, Lord Keynes uh, saying that, uh, that this is rubbish because gravity is an empirically proven force. Marx's socially necessary labor time is not. And this is also incorrect because yeah. the okay la labor values can be calculated and they can indeed be shown to exist okay to have you know uh, to be computed to be estimated and they can indeed show be shown to be the centers of gravity of market prices now i show this in my thesis okay using empirical data and there are plenty of studies showing this exact same uh, thing on many different countries on many different years so lord keynes is once again wrong here when he says that Okay, gravity is empirical, but socially necessary labor value isn't. But it is empirical as well. And this, even if it wasn't, okay, this doesn't this doesn't deny the point that I was making about scientific development. Okay, in the same way that Newton's theory of gravity doesn't contradict itself, Marx's theory of value doesn't contradict itself either. Now I'm going to be explaining why. Okay. Okay, I'm a scientific idiot, so feel free to laugh at me for this if I'm very wrong. But I was under the impression that. Gravity is inferred to explain empirically proven dynamics. It isn't itself empirically proven. Am I mistaken about that? Is that a correct way to characterize can you, it? Can you ask the question again? Sorry. Sure. So Newton's theory of gravity, of course, didn't establish that there is some kind of force that causes things from above to go down. Um, Newton's theory of gravity is a way of understanding what causes things that are up to go down, it causes two bodies to come towards each other. 
It isn't yeah, itself it's impure. A, it's basically the, the okay. So it's basically the description of a natural force yeah. that, in a sense, brings objects together of a certain mass at a certain distance. Okay, so we know all of this. So it is a description of of a natural thing or something that happens in the real world, and you're positing something that we can actually, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that, that 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 we can actually um, test as the explanation for this, okay? Now, you could say that it is angels, okay, moving things here and there, that it is something that is uh, supernatural, that is actually behind the movement of objects in space. Yeah. But this would be unfalsifiable. It's not the same case for, for Newton's theory of gravity, okay? Yeah. No, but I mean, like, the, the basic point here, though, is that his, his argument here that this is rubbish because gravity is an empirically proven force, whereas Marx is socially necessary labor time is not. These are equivalent though. They serve an equivalent explanatory role in understanding empirical data. Yeah, they they serve, yeah, let's yeah. say, uh, an analogous, an analogous. It's not 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 equivalent sure. because, you know, everything would need to be the same, but yeah, it is yeah, analogous, okay? It resonates. And this is why uh, I wanted to make exactly the same point because, you know, the same way that this is not a contradiction, Marx is not contradicting himself either. So now let me explain to you exactly why Marx was not contradicting himself in volume three of Das Kapital, which, by the way, he didn't publish, okay, because he didn't finish because he died. You know, unfortunately, he, mm -hmm. he died. Now, okay, so so let me, uh, I have here some equations prepared, but I first want to um, give you a little bit of the story of what, what is going on in volume one of Das Kapital. So in volume one, Marx hasn't introduced, okay, uh, all of the specific forces that he's going to introduce later, okay? So he's trying to describe things at a level of abstraction that is obviously going to have to be superseded, okay? But that is why what scientific procedure is all about. Okay, scientific procedure is about presenting certain propositions and then showing how, through the incorporation of subsequent specifications, how the theory that you're presenting is being modified and how it develops and how it is specified itself. Okay. This is basically what scientific, you know, presentation of scientific concepts is all about. Mm -hmm. Now, this is basically what Marx is doing. So in volume one, he's presenting a scenario, okay, where there is, uh, okay, so at the beginning, he's talking just about commodities, okay, and then he's talking about surplus value and about what are the sources, okay, what is, that surplus value being, in a sense, the source of profits. But he hasn't said everything in volume one. So what is basically the, the, the let's say, the environment in which Marx is, is moving in volume one? Okay, it's an environment where there is uh, a turbulent equalization of profit rates, but there hasn't been a discussion of the inequality between organic compositions of capital. Okay? Yeah. He's abstracting, okay, from the inequality of organic compositions of capital. And he's talking, okay, just at the level of an equalization of profit rates, which implies, okay, show, and, and, and I show this in my thesis, uh, using Adam Smith. Uh, rude and early state of society, I show this, and, and Warshak shows this, and, and many other people have shown this, basically that under these circumstances, okay, the the basic labor theory of value holds perfectly well, which is, okay, prices are directly proportional to labor times. Now, let's keep into consideration, and Marx already notes this, that prices are always and everywhere different from value, because value is abstract social necessary labor time and prices are money categories okay they are mm -hmm. expressions of monetary expressions of something of, of exchange value okay yeah so they are already different things mm -hmm. but they are different things but nevertheless okay one is going to be the center of gravity of the other yeah but they are different things so then this is important because the transformation problem is not going to be one from value to price but one from one form of value so from one type of price to another form of value, so to another form of price. This is important because in volume one, we are talking about direct prices. And direct prices are the ones that emerge, okay, from the qualization of profit rates, or in the case of Adam Smith, uh, early, rude and early state of society, which is what we're going to go next in the video, okay? Uh, in, this, in that case, the qualization of incomes per hour, okay? This implies systematically that prices are going to be directly proportional to labor times, okay, to the labor values of that society, of that economy, okay? Yeah. Now, what is the important thing here? Is if you include, okay, another thing, then 
this is going to be more complex. And now, if, if you want, I can uh, like if you want, I can move now to like a, a more specific discussion of of this question before we even continue, because now he's going sure. to talk about the rude and early Please. state, and and I want to get this out of the way before we go there. Okay, so let me share my screen. Um, let me share my screen. I need elevator music for this. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So so can you uh -huh. see the, the Word document that I have here yep. with me right now? Sure can. It can be seen, right? Uh -huh. Okay. So first, let me explain a little bit about what is mathematically, what does proportionality mean, okay? So that we get a sense of what direct prices, so prices directly proportional to labor times means. Okay, so two quantities, okay, are directly proportional if the ratio yields a constant. Okay, so if we can express the, the ratio as a constant, which implies that we can find an equivalent equation that expresses, okay, basically that the quantity in the numerator or here the variable in the numerator is equal, okay, to the what is called here this beta is what I like to call the constant of proportionality. It's also called the coefficient of proportionality times the second quantity or this, this second variable, okay? So in this case, the proportionality between prices, direct prices and labor times, implies that X1 here is the price in industry in one industry, okay, let's say, beta is the constant of proportionality, and this X2 would be the labor value of that industry, okay? This is what proportionality means. And it's important to note this because this is the form that direct prices take. The form of being directly proportional to labor values. Yeah. And this is very analytically simple. And we can show a numerical example uh, where, okay, equalization of profit rates without including, without incorporating more specifications implies that this is going to be a true relationship between prices and labor values. Okay. And these direct prices are in that scenario the uh, let's say the natural prices. Okay. They are the centers of gravity of market prices, which as Keith rightly points in the video uh, before talking about the contradiction, they are not necessarily equal to market prices, but they are the centers of gravity of prices, okay? It's, it's a turbulent equalization that takes place. Now, okay, so now we come to volume three, okay? And now we come to the really important thing of this discussion, which is that different organic compositions of capital between industries implies a systematic deviation of prices of, okay, so of, of, the, of the natural prices from strict proportionality with labor values. But this doesn't deny the labor theory of value. It doesn't even deny the labor theory of value as presented in the level of a specification of volume one. It is just, okay, a, an analytical development. So uh, let me show you this, okay? So this row here, okay, this is the, the Greek letter for uh, for what I'm going to be calling here the, the rate of profit in value terms, okay, in value terms. And I'm gonna be showing what the rate of profit in money terms looks like. Uh, okay, so rho here is the rate of profit in value terms. So how can we express this? As the ratio of the surplus value to the total investment, so the constant capital plus the variable capital, okay? Now we can algebraically, we can modify this expression to be in the following form, okay? Just, just for clarification before you go on, for people in the audience, constant and variable capital, can you characterize those for us? Sure, 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 sure. So <laughs> constant capital, okay, is the capital that basically takes the form of raw materials of the means of production, okay? Of the machinery and so on and so forth. And constant capital, okay, it's called constant capital because it only transfers its own value into, to into the total product. It doesn't add value beyond what it already has. However, variable capital and variable capital here is the, the capital that is employed to employ, okay? Labor, labor power, okay? This is basically what constitutes the, the basis for wages Okay, the material basis for wages, variable capital, is okay, variable because it can be extended to work beyond what it's needed for its own reproduction. And that is okay, why we differentiate these two categories, why Marx differentiates these two categories. So the total investment that the capitalist does at the beginning of the production process is one that is the sum of the constant capital and the variable capital. Okay? Or in more modern terms, okay, capital and labor. Yeah. Okay, although okay, although they, they take different definitions, okay, but just for everyone to understand. And then is S is surplus value. So it is the value that is created above and beyond what was employed, okay, for production. 
Now we can algebraically modify this expression, okay? And it is equivalent, this new expression is equivalent to this one, to one where basically we express, okay, the rate of profit as the ratio of what is called the rate of surplus value, okay? Or the rate of exploitation, which is S over V, over, okay, C plus V over V. Now, this, okay, has certain meaning, but we can further see what the meaning of this, of the denominator is by uh, employing another algebraic uh, modification of this uh, particular expression into this one, okay? So we have that the rate of profit in value terms can be expressed as the ratio of the rate of surplus value to the organic composition of capital plus one. What is the organic composition of capital? The, the ratio of the constant capital to the variable capital, okay? Mm. So if we take this into consideration and we are in volume one of this capital, okay, the scenario is one where if, if this is the rate of profit of industry I, okay, the rate of profit of all industries, okay, tends to be equalized to this one. And that implies that both the rate of surplus value and the, and the organic composition of capital are equalized I as well, okay? They have to be equal too. But then Marx in volume three asks the question, okay, first he asks the question, do rates of surplus value get equalized between industries? And then he presents an argu argu argument for why this is the case, okay? And then he goes to the question, is it, a, is it an assumption, okay? Is it a tenable assumption to assume that the organic compositions of capital are equalized between different industries? And then his conclusion is that this is not, in fact, right. a sustainable assumption, okay? Because different industries require different proportions of capital, to, to, of constant capital to variable capital. Okay, some are more capital intensive than others. Just for absolute clarity, give give an example. Okay, let's say that you have okay a barber shop. Yeah. Okay, maybe in a barber shop you don't need as much constant capital as in a in a in an industry where cars are produced, for example, where you need a lot more machinery, where you need a lot more raw, raw materials. Okay, maybe in a barber shop you just need like the scissors, the chair, the table, and and that's it. Okay. So then some industries are obviously by nature more capital intensive than others. And this is a fact of reality. Now, is this a contradiction with volume one? Okay, at this level of analysis? No, because at volume one, he's just saying, okay, let us abstract from the fact that there are different organic compositions of capital between industries. What is the solution in this scenario? Well, it is one where all the profit rates are equal because they get equalized and because the money rate of profit, which is this one, is directly proportional to the to the value rate of profit. So it is, it is the same, sorry, it is the same as the value rate of profit in this case, okay? Because all of the quantities are directly proportional. Then also the money rates of profit get equalized and we have a very simple analytical scenario, okay? Profit rates get equalized. Uh, uh, prices are directly proportional to labor times, okay? So in this, okay, the money rate of profit that I call here R, okay, M prime can be here seen as the monetary, uh, let's say the, the monetary revenue, okay, of, of any given industry or of the whole economy, okay? And this M, okay, is the money costs, okay? So it is the money costs. It is the sum of the money cost in constant capital, okay, what I, what I call here M, MC plus MV, okay, this is M. So it's the sum of the money employed in, in the employment of constant capital and in the employment of variable capital. Okay, so what is the rate of profit? Okay, again, it is the revenue, so, it, so it's the ratio of the revenues over the costs. Okay, sorry, of, of the profits over the costs. That is what the rate of profit is. The ratio of the profits over the costs. So this is basically what we have here, okay? M prime, again, is the revenue, the total revenue minus the costs. This is what is called delta M, okay? So it is the profits. It's what you earn minus what was, and this could be negative, by the way, this could be negative, okay? It doesn't need to be positive. It is the the the, the difference between what you earn and what you, uh, in a sense, employed at the beginning, okay? What you invested. Uh, it is also, this is also called the rate of return, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if uh, we are moving in volume one, okay? These quantities, okay, M prime and M are directly proportional to the value quantities. So then these two rates of profit are the same. But now, okay, in volume three, because we have included, okay, the caveat that the organic composition of, of, of capital don't get equalized and therefore the, the value rates of profit are not equal between industries, 
now we have a situation where there is no longer this direct proportionality. You, you see why? There's not going to be the R's, okay? So all of the rates of profit in money terms are also not going to be equal because at prices proportional to labor values, mm -hmm. okay? If these are not equal, so if the, if the value rate of profit are not equal, the money rates of profit are not going to be equal either, okay? Right. At, at, at prices proportional to labor time. So at the prices of volume one, at direct prices. So then Marx asks, what, what needs to happen now for us to, to continue understanding this situation? And then, because this is an analytical question, Marx says, okay, so the prices need to be, in a sense, uh, uh, need to move, need to be uh, uh, changed, okay, from the ones that they are right now to another one. And basically what is going to happen is that these rates of profit are going to get equalized around the average, okay, rate of profit of that economy. And a numerical example is really good for this. Okay, uh, and Walsh in his uh, in his uh, 1973 paper, I think it is, uh, he he has uh, this numerical example. And the other day with fellow traveler, uh, we went through the numerical example, and basically he shows that um, okay, so these rates of profit tend to equalize around the average. Okay, this is not technically correct because we need to include a further caveat. Okay, but just for the analysis, let's say that they get equalized around the average. So what is going to happen is that the the industries that have a profit rate below the averages, okay, below the, the average, are going to see their price increase so that they can bring, okay, their money revenues up so that then they can have a, a, a rate of profit that is higher and that moves towards the average. And the vice versa is going to happen with the ones that had a profit rate higher than average, okay? So now he does this for all commodities, okay, for all commodities, considered as conceptualized as outputs. And Marx does this first step, okay, in, in his notes for volume three. And then comes the question of the incompleteness of the transformation procedure, where the whole problem comes from. Because Menger, okay, who was, who was I don't know if he was reading volume three, to be honest, but he said, okay, Marx didn't finish this procedure. Marx told us that there needs to be a, a change in prices of the commodities considered as outputs, but the, the commodities considered as inputs haven't been changed. Those prices haven't been changed. So then the question is, and Menger didn't take this question, of course, because he just wanted to get an easy dunk on Marx, is, okay. This is Carl Menger, the Austrian economist, to be clear. Yes. So then the question is, okay, what do we know now? <laughs> okay, what do we know? And at this point, the, the brains of many Marxists throughout history stopped working, okay? At this point, many Marxists didn't know what to do anymore, okay? Because then a lot of people came and said, okay, but now even at these transformed prices, the prices are no longer directly proportional to labor values. So now this comes, this is the question of the, the famous contradiction, okay? Now prices are no longer proportional to labor values. Mm. So then, okay, Shaik takes in the 1970s this question and he says, okay, what does Marx say that we need to do in order to continue this procedure? And Marx says it clearly. He says, you need to feed back the effect of the change of prices in the first step uh, of the commodities considered as outputs. You need to feed back that effect into the commodities considered as inputs. So, and Marx does this, okay? And he realizes that the, there is, you know, a, a small error that continues to appear as you do this, you know, this process. And he notices, okay, that what is going on here is that we have an iterative solution to a system of simultaneous equations. And this is basically what he does, okay, in that paper is he shows how, algebraically, he shows how you can solve, okay, for the full procedure using, you know, linear algebra. And what you get at the end is, okay, equalized money rates of profit. And what you get is prices, okay, that express the transformation of direct prices into prices of production. Okay, so from one form of value into another form of value, what you get is this transformation of those commodities considered as inputs and as outputs, okay, of those prices. So you get all of the steps that were needed in order for that procedure to be completed. But then there is a following question, which is, okay, now those prices, those fully transformed prices are still not directly proportional to labor values. So 
then, okay, a person like Lord Keynes would come and say, okay, therefore the contradiction still holds. But again, there's no contradiction here because we've included this fact and now we want to say, okay, so there is this deviation and now we need to take into account this systematic deviation of prices of production, which again are the centers of gravity of market prices from strict proportionality with labor values. So now that we understand that this is systematic, that it occurs, then we want to ask, what is the size? Because the size is going to be really the important part for the theory. Because if this size is moderate, and if this size is determinate, okay, then we have an argument for the labor theory of value still. And Marx didn't get, okay, to fully develop this theory as I'm going to be presenting to you right now. But he did give us hints, okay? And, and Shaikh, following those hints, came with this solution. Okay, and this is the important thing, that even though some authors don't live to fully develop their, their theories, they leave hints and we can follow those hints in order to see if those theories lead somewhere productive. And I'm, as I'm going to be showing you also with empirical data, we in fact get to somewhere quite productive, okay? And this is, again, something that Lord Keynes nor Keith Woods, of, of course, Keith Woods either, uh, understand. Now, okay, just quickly before we go on. So I see Lord Keynes has repeated in the comments that Victor is confusing Menger with Eugene von Bomberwerk. Um, I mean, von Bauwerk obviously criticized Marx as well, but we also have critiques from Menger. Yeah. And from and we also have critiques from, uh, from all of the other Austrian economists. And they all follow very similar roads. We also have Schumpeter, who actually had a very nice, uh, you know, a very nice uh, review of Marx although it is also mistaken in a lot of respects, but at least Schumpeter gave certain good insights, okay, which is something that uh, certainly not too many people had given before. Mm -hmm. So let me let me show you this, okay? Okay, so, uh, so now we have the following thing, okay? Before direct prices, which were prices directly proportional to labor times, were the ones that served as the centers of gravity of market prices. But now, okay, bef because we understand that there are different organic compositions of capital between industries, we can no longer say that this is the case under these new circumstances. So these new circumstances give us a scenario where it is prices of production that are now the centers of gravity of market prices. But, okay, prices of production need not be very different from direct prices, okay? They can indeed be very close to direct prices. And this is the question, okay? What is the deviation? What is the size of the deviation of price of production and direct prices? Can I just and pause it, you there for a second? This is a little, yeah. this is just kind of bothering me. So in the comments, Lord Keynes has just called you a liar. Where did Menger critique Marx? I have here open Karl Menger's critique. <clears throat> Opponents of Marxian economics argue that the labor theory of values is proven as commodities may diverge from the average price of production. In his 1871 work, Principles of Economics, Austrian school economist Karl Menger writes, there is no necessary and direct connection between the value of a good and whether or in what quantities. Labor and other goods of higher order were applied to its production. A non-economic good, a quantity of timber in a virgin forest, for example, does not attain value for men since large quantities of labor or other economic goods were not applied to its production. Whether a diamond was found accidentally or was obtained from a diamond pit with the employment of a thousand days of labor is completely irrelevant for its value. In general, no one in practical life asks for the history of the origin of a good and estimating its value, but considers slowly the services that the good will render him and which he would have to forgo if he did not have it at his command. The quantities of labor or of other means of production applied to its production cannot, I promise there are only two more sentences left, therefore be the determining factor in the value of a good. Comparison of the value of a good with the value of the means of production employed in its production does, of course, show whether and to what extent its production, an act of past human activity, was appropriate or economic. But the quantities of goods employed in the production of a good have neither a necessary nor a directly determining influence on its value. So there. Can we continue now? Yes, we can. Okay. So this is not even this is not even an important point. So so like let's continue with this. Okay. So now the question is, okay, now that we have understood okay, that there is this systematic deviation, now the question is, what is the size of this deviation? And we can tackle this question both theoretically and empirically. So what I'm going to be doing first is show you theoretically how the argument plans out. Okay. So uh, this, okay, what you have in the screen here is what I like to, what I call in my thesis, the Smith-Shake decomposition of price, okay? Because Smith gave 
the basically the structure of this press decomposition. Okay, uh, so so he basically outlined it, and then Smith, uh, sorry, and then Shaikh, uh, in a sense, systematized and formalized this. Uh, what we call this the composition of price, okay? And now we're talking about the decomposition of prices, but we're talking about the case of prices of production, which is the case, okay, where profit rates and wage rates are equalized across industries, okay? Uh, as we were talking about before. So, so let's let, let's uh, let's consider this, okay? So I'm not going to be showing you how the price decomposition is done. I'm just going to be showing you what it looks like, okay? Because otherwise I would be here for the entire night. So let's start from this, okay? So this PI here is the price of production of the ith industry, okay? Now, what we can see is that we can express through this decomposition this price as the sum of the vertical integrated profits that I call here phi uh, uh, star of the industry i plus mu star of the industry i, okay? Which are the vertical integrated labor costs of that industry, okay? So what does vertical integration mean? Okay, vertical integration is a concept that is uh, basically, uh, in a sense, given name by by uh, Luigi Pasinetti, okay, which is an Italian economist, very prominent uh, for his arguments in the Cambridge Capital controversies, okay, and basically what he defined, okay, vertical integration as is the direct and indirect components of any given variable, okay, so it's the sum of the direct and the indirect components of a variable. So in this case, okay, the vertical integrated profits are the profits. So the direct profits of the ith industry, so the profit that the ith industry earns directly, plus, okay, the profits of all of the other industries that enter into the production of the ith industry, okay? And with input output tables, we can, in fact, track this. And this is why we can calculate these things, which is something that uh, uh, Lord Keynes was saying that we couldn't do, but we can, in fact, do with input output tables. And the same goes for labor costs. So we have the direct labor cost, of that industry, okay? So what that industry directly, uh, what labor directly costs to that industry and what the cost of labor is indirectly from the input of all of the other industries that go into the production of the commodity of the ith industry, okay? Now we can uh, further, okay, manipulate this algebraically uh, by noting, okay, that the vertical integrated costs are equal in the case of price of production to the homogeneous wage rate the wage rate that gets equalized across the entire economy times okay the this vi which is the uh, the vertical integrated labor time that goes into the production of the commodity of that industry which is basically the industry's labor value okay mm. so it's the direct and indirect labor times that go into the production of the ith commodity okay of the commodity produced by the ith industry and if we notice, okay, that this can be expressed as that multiplication, then we can further, okay, manipulate this equation to look like this. And what does this look like? Okay, this looks like the homogeneous wage rate times the labor value times one plus this ratio that is called the profit to wage ratio. Okay, the profit to wage ratio. Because it's the vertical integrated profits over the vertical integrated labor costs. So it is the vertical integrated profit to wage ratio. Now, if we notice uh, that we can do this and then we can call, okay, the vertical the vertical integrated profit to wage ratio, we can call it omega star, okay, omega star. So if we know that we can, uh, okay, uh, present the price of production in this form, okay, algebraically, then we can ask the question, okay, what about relative prices? How can we see the transformation problem in the pure algebraic form of relative prices? We can see it in the following way, okay? So take, okay, the ratio of the price, the price of production of the ith industry to the price of production of the jth industry, okay? So this is how it looks, okay? It looks like the homogeneous wage rate times the, the labor value of the ith industry plus one, uh, uh, times one plus the vertical integrated profit to wage ratio in that industry and the same in the, in the the for the second industry, okay? So the wage rates get canceled mm -hmm. because it's the same thing, okay, both in the numerator and the denominator, so they cancel out. So what are we left with? We are left with the relative labor values times the relative uh, uh, profit to wage ratios, vertical integrated profit to wage ratios. So we can further express this as this, where this, okay, is basically that this is called, uh, what we call, okay, the disturbance factor. And why do we call this a disturbance factor? Because if organic compositions of capital are different across industries, then the profit to wage ratios are also different across industries. 
Correct. If they were equal, okay, if profit to wage ratios were equal, like in volume one, okay, where we don't consider that they are unequal, uh, then, okay, the relationship, this would be one, okay? This term here would be one, would be equal to one. And if it if, and if, it, if it's equal to one, then price of, relative prices of production are equal to relative labor values. So then prices are directly proportional to labor to labor times, okay? And the constant of proportionality is defined by the wage rate and this term, mm -hmm. okay, for each case. But now these terms are not equal across industries. So since they are not equal across industries, now this term is not equal to one. It's different from one. And the fact that it's different from one means that if you multiply it times the labor values, what is going to be the output of this equation is different to the labor values themselves, to the relative labor values. And this is basically the, 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 what Marx introduces in volume three. So then again, the question is, what is the size of this deviation? What is the size of this factor because if this factor is and we can show this theoretically and empirically to be very small very close to one then the transformation problem is empirically and and even theoretically a non-issue if this factor is very small so then we can go into what is the, what is the vertical integrated profit to wage ratio what what does that mean and there's where we have the the key okay to the solution of this problem Okay, so let's look at the formal structure of the uh, of the vertical integrated profit to wage ratio. Okay, so it is okay the, the omega star. Okay, and we are not specifying any industry. This could be any industry. Okay, so this is the the ratio, and we can note okay that the profit to wage is that that the vertical integrated profits are the direct profit. Okay, so this phi plus the the profit of the of the second industry as considered as an input in the first industry. So the indirect uh, profit of the first industry into the, the of the second industry into the first industry okay into this industry and all of the other industries okay so so you see what this is okay, it is the sum of the direct and the indirect profits that go into this industry into the industry that we are considering and how can we express also uh, vertical integrated labor time uh, labor costs as the wage rate the homogeneous wage rate times the uh, labor value of that industry. So then we can further take this, okay, uh, manipulate this algebraically and put it in this form. And we can even put it in a better in a, in a better form where we can even get a, a, a better, uh, you know, we can see this more clearly. But even in this form, we can see basically what, I, what I'm trying to show. We can see it in this form as well, okay, which is that what we are left with is that the vertical integrated profit to wage ratio is a convex combination of the direct and in the indirect profit to wage ratios that go into that industry. Okay. And since, okay, and this is what, what Rafa notes because Lord Keynes and, and Keith in this video are going to uh, pretend like Rafa was, you know, like, like a high critic of Marx that completely debunked the labor theory of value. But if they read closely into Rafa, they would see that Rafa agreed with Marx, for example, in the proposition that labor value, that labor, so that labor value aggregates were going to be equal to the aggregates, the price aggregates. Okay. So as Rafa already pointed this out. Okay. So Rafa is not this, you know, Lord that, that completely destroyed the labor theory of value, the complete opposite. Okay. He gave actually the theoretical uh, uh, reasons for why, uh, for the modern developments of the labor theory of value. And you can ask and watch Shaikh for this. So uh, le let's let's continue with this, okay? So Rafa notes that since all the industries are interconnected, what this means, okay, is that the vertical integrated profit to wage ratio of any industry, okay, is a weighted average of all of the other profit to wage ratios. Because all the industries are interconnected in mm -hmm. an economy. Because all industries produce something that the other industries need. And you can see this empirically also with the input output tables. And this is why they are so important for the empirical uh, uh, testing of the theory. So what does this mean? Okay. So it means that even if direct profit to waste ratios between industries are very different. So even if the organic compositions of capital between industries were extremely different between one another, vertical integration brings them together because now they, they you, because when you integrate when you vertically integrate profit to wage ratios okay 
and you see that they are uh, that they are a weighted average of all of the other profit to waste ratios, you see that their dispersion gets closer when you vertically integrate them, which means that even if the direct profit to waste ratios are very different, the vertical integrated profit to waste ratios are going to be very m far more close to each other, even in the in the in the extreme case where they would be very different. Mm. What's an acceptable range? In okay, terms so of how okay okay so this is this is what I'm going to show you now empirically okay but okay. Uh, but now let's let's just look at this question theor purely theoretical okay purely theoretical because this depends obviously on on the on the economy that you're looking at okay the range depends on how far apart they are empirically uh, uh, in any given industry so so you can give a range but you know like it, what really matters is what economies really show you not mm -hmm. what you can think okay but theoretically we can already see that Vertical integration brings the profit to waste ratios closer together, which means that if you take the ratio, okay, of one profit to waste ratio to another one, it's not going to be very far apart from one, okay? Theoretically, we're going to already see that this term is not going to be very far apart from one. And if this term is not very far apart from one, and this term is the disturbance factor, then the disturbance is going to be small. So then the deviation of, of, of relative prices from relative labor values is going to be also moderate and it's going to be, you know, systematized and it's going to be determined. So it's going to be determined and it's going to be moderate. So we can already see this theoretically. Well, I think in addition, what you'd look for isn't necessarily that the um, that the disturbance is, is, is small, but it's small and consistent, right? Exactly. So, so, so yeah. it is it is small and it is determinate. Okay, it is determinate. We can actually make a case for why this is not going to be a, a very significant factor and in time series okay in time series regressions we can also show this not to be a very significant factor through time and this is also a, a, a an important question for marx okay so now it now comes empirical data okay now what does the empirical evidence say about the deviations between direct prices okay which would be the prices where this factor is one and uh prices of production which is those prices where this factor is different from one Okay, because of different profit to wage ratios. So I'm going to show you the uh, a chart, uh, so a figure of my own thesis, but you can see this in many other papers. Okay, so it is this is just what I what I produced. Okay, but this is the same pattern and and actually even closer deviations in other papers. Okay, so this is what I have here for the Spanish economy for the years 2010, 2015, and 2016. Okay, so I computed direct prices and prices of production, and prices of production were computed through a uh, a pure circulating capital model, okay, which is uh, a model that can be improved, okay, if you include uh, uh, the constant, so the, the fixed capital, okay, so you can use, you know, a fixed capital uh, model and it would be better than the pure circulating capital model, but because of data limitations, I couldn't do that, okay, but uh, it doesn't really matter because the circulating capital model still gives us, you know, uh, consistent results, although, you know, we should employ uh, better the fixed capital but even the fixed capital again this is something that uh, Ochoa and, and Shaikh uh, also argue that the fixed capital model produces even smaller deviations okay produces smaller deviations because it tends to estimate the rate of profit as being a, a, a higher rate of profit so a lower rate of profit sorry than it, that it, than the circulating uh, capital model okay and this brings the deviation uh, down Okay, uh, and I also show this in my thesis why this is the case and, and how you can see this graphically. But in, in any case, okay, so these are the normalized vectors, okay, of direct prices and prices of production, and they are plotted in a in a graph that has here a forty five degree line. So this is not a regression line. This is a forty five degree line, okay, and the forty five degree line in any in any two D graph tells you the point at which these two different things, okay, so this, the, these two different variables are equal to each other. Okay, so in the 45 degree line, they are equal to each other. So this is not a regression line. Okay. Regressions line, the regression lines are not 45 degree lines. Okay. They are lines that again give you, you know, a fit, but this is different. And it's important because what I'm doing here is not regression analysis. And I always point this out to people that don't understand how this works. So this is how, how this is done. Okay. So if these prices are close together, so if direct prices and direct, so if price of production and direct prices are very close together, then the points here should be very close to the 45 degree line. And it turns out that they are indeed very close to the 45 degree line. And they are normalized. So when you normalize a vector, okay, you divide 
the vector by its norm. Okay, you divide the vector by its norm. So that's why you can compare them in this in this particular fashion. Okay, you need to normalize them first. Otherwise, you cannot do this. This uh, you know, you're gonna plot them in this in this manner. So what this shows basically, and, and okay, so this is how you can see these deviations graphically, but the actual, with using the mean absolute weighted deviation, which is a measure of vector distance, okay? Using the mean absolute weighted deviation, you can see that this div that the deviation, okay, the average deviation between these three different years is of 23.8%, okay, of 23.8%. So we can see that even in the light of the transformation problem, okay, of the transformation procedure, because I'm, I'm, I argue that is, this is not a problem, it's just a procedure that has a beginning point and an ending point, that even in the light of that particular factor, these prices are very close together. So the deviation between them is systematic and it is small and it is determinate. And, pap and, and other papers, okay, using the fixed capital model and using different countries and, 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 and bigger time spans than the one that I use here, okay, they show this same thing they show this exact same result and even smaller deviations. They show even smaller deviations, okay? My deviation is among the higher uh, rank of deviations between these things. Right, and that's a what, 20% roughly? It's 23.3, 23%, yeah. But there, there are papers that show like 13%, seven, under 10%, okay? For people just coming in, by the way, I know we're an hour in and about three minutes into Keith's video. The long and short of it, is that volume three is not a contradiction to volume one, but an elaboration. Just move on from there. <laughs> we should have put a math warning. Your uh, your faith in my capacity to retain information is inspiring me. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so now we have come to the end of the of the transformation problem. Okay. So this is okay. The modern development. Okay. Of 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 the conception of volume three of the labor theory value of volume three. Okay. So yes. There is now a systematic deviation of price of production from direct proportionality with labor times, with labor values, okay? But this deviation is, is, is moderate, it is determinate, okay? So the labor theory of value still holds. And now it's also the question of how close are prices of production, which are the centers of gravity of market prices, to actual market prices? And this is also a question that I take in my paper and that Angwalshe takes in his papers, and Ochoa and, and Sulfides and Maniadis also take, for example, okay? And this, empirically, we also see that prices of production are indeed very close to uh, market prices in cross-sectional data for many different years, for many different countries. So again, to Lord Keynes, who was saying before that, no, 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 uh, prices of production are not the centers of gravity of market prices. Why then does the, set, the, does the data show that they are? Okay, that's, that's a good question for him. Why does this that data show that they are? And if we also see this question, okay, and we take this question in a time series hypothesis, okay, so that changes in labor values are going to explain changes in prices, and we take this question empirically, we also see that this is the case. Okay? So then that's another uh, empirical question that has been met with empirical success. Okay, that even in, 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 in long time spans, this factor is still small. So, this is pretty much uh, the, the the question, okay, regarding this. And in my channel, I already discussed certain aspects of this question. I'm going to be discussing with much more specificity all of these questions. But um, I, I want basically to 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 give you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what this looks like, okay, and what and why this is not a problem actually, and why the the data, okay, agrees. Okay, with the Marxist yeah. position that these deviations are small and they are determinate and they are moderate, and it also agrees, okay, with uh, the and, and actually that this transformation procedure is a procedure and that there's no contradiction. Okay, so okay, so so Lord well, Keynes needs to revise, and and Keith they need to revise what the what what it means for something to be a contradiction. Oh, then they need to revise, revise Jack. It. But uh, before we move on, Lord Keynes uh, insists as a final remark the data does not show that they are. There's no strong tendency to equalization of profit rates. But even Marx, like Zachariah, find no evidence of this. I submit that he might want to see if he can fly as well. Shall we continue? Yes. For example, in Chapter 10 of Volume 3, he explains that, quote, the exchange of commodities at their values, or approximately at their values, requires, therefore, 
a much lower stage than their exchange at their prices of production, which requires a relatively high development of capitalist production. So can you stop it here? So here Marx was like saying that... For a that second. For second. second. Okay. Okay, so, let's go. So what, what Heath is trying to do here, okay, he's trying to go for the, for the other meme that I pointed out, okay, which is that Marx actually believed that there was such thing as a rude and early state of society, that it was an actual existing determinate period in history. And he's trying to provide here a quote to justify this position, but this is not what is being said here. It's not being said, okay, that this was an actual existing point in history. It just says that uh, for 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 there to be, okay, for the simple labor theory of value to be the case, okay, theoretically, what would need to happen is exactly this: that there would need to be a much lower stage to society where uh, uh, we're here, okay, uh, we don't consider price of production in the form that I already discussed. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is what is being said. It's not being said that this was an actual existing point in history, but rather that this would be the condition of a society for it to meet the criteria of the simple labor theory of value of Adam Smith and of Marx Volume 1. Okay? But this is not Marx accepting... So here condition. Marx was saying that... Oh, oh sorry. I was just... I, was, I thought you were done. But Keith here is going to is going to pretend like Marx is saying something that he's not saying. At the theory of value in volume one, that commodities tend to exchange at their pure labor values, which are anchors for the price system, was a historically contingent phenomenon existing. Exactly, he in doesn't what say he calls... that. He doesn't say that. See, he doesn't say that. It was not a historically, and he corrected Smith on this because Smith did believe this. But but Marx not. But Smith yes, but of... Marx no. <laughs> okay, yeah. of capitalist production your pauses were perfectly fine the emergence of a higher <laughs> stage of capitalism where ricardo's prices of production are now the anchors of the price system furthermore friedrich engels defended this view in a letter to werner sombart in 1894 he wrote that quote when commodity exchange began when products gradually turned into commodities they were exchanged approximately according to their value we know that this direct realization of value in exchange ceased and that it now no longer happens. This will, of course, be news to many of the Marxists who still defend the original formulation of LTV as applicable to today's economic system. One of the most famous critics of Marx's theory of value, Bon Baverk, was actually able to identify no less than four different formulations of a theory of value in Marx's capital. We can see why Marxists have such trouble. And he was wrong. And von Bauer was wrong. Just to, just to make that clear. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit? Yeah, because Marx didn't present different uh, theories. He presented the same theory, but different theoretical developments of the same theory, Th yeah. different analytical stages of the same theory. But Again, not different we're, looking, theories. we're looking at like a distance of like this, right? Like it, it, it's a little bit, it's a, it's a little bit silly. And it was going to be much, much bigger than that. It was going to six be six volumes, six volumes of this. Like the man was insane. And the I'm other sorry. two are not even, are not even complete. You know, they're not even what Marx would have put as the actual volumes. It's Aren't just the even... notes as compiled by Engels. Okay. Even the notes are huge, but he finished it in the notes. Like they, it, it was it was plotted out. Trouble agreeing on what Marx actually believed, but despite Marx's later abandonment of the LTV formulated in Volume One of Capital, this is still the formulation that most Marxists subscribe to today, and it can rightly be argued that Marx later backtracking or contradicting this okay. uh, argument is not. Uh, open and shut case against the theory itself. And I'm sure many Marxists will maintain that Marx never actually abandoned his law of value. So let's look more deeply at how Marx formulated this first uh, conventional formulation of the labor theory of value. Now, Marx's chief influence for his work were Hegelian philosophy and English classical economics. So Marx actually took the idea that labor is a measure of value from David Ricardo who in turn was inspired by Adam Smith's first formulation of the labor theory of value. Adam Smith postulated that labor time was the criterion used in primitive societies to determine exchange value. Quote, in that early and rude state of society, 
which precedes both the accumulation of stock and the appropriation of land, the proportion between the quantities of labor necessary for acquiring different objects seems to be the only circumstance which can afford any rules for exchanging them for one another. If among a nation of hunters, for example, it usually costs twice the labor to kill a beaver, which it does to kill a deer, one beaver should naturally exchange for or be worth two deer. It is natural that what is usually the produce of two days or two hours labor should be worth double of what is usually the produce of one day's or one hour's labor. Can you stop it? We can already see the problems with Yes. So I gave this exact same quote in my thesis, okay? I present this exact same quote. I know, I read it. And I note, <laughs> yeah, and I note, and what I note is basically that, yes, Adam Smith is making this look like an actual historical moment, but it's not, okay? And it has been conceived later on as an analytical stage rather than an actual existing stage. But even if we look at it only as an analytical stage, it makes complete sense, okay? And we can see how, by modifying the assumptions of this stage, we can get to a more, uh, let's say, specific theory. Okay, but okay, the fact that Adam Smith believed that this was a, a concrete period in history doesn't refute the theory, because we understand that this is just an analytical stage. Well, he also makes overt denials of this as being a specifically, uh, again, as 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 a literal historical point in time. Um, I think in the critique of political economy, he even points out that like. Like, look, r realistically or historically, um, these markets weren't within tribes. They were between tribes or between nations. So, yeah, so Marx didn't, and this is okay, again, what I say, Marx didn't believe that the root and early state of society was an actual period in history. And I'm this gonna, is the meme that I say that it's not the case for Marx, but it is the case for me. I'm going to say, let's take a quick two or so minute uh, bathroom intermission if... You don't require that. Um, I'll leave you to uh, bludgeon Lord Fiends for a bit while I'm gone. Okay, okay, okay. Let, let, let me see here in the comments if I read anything interesting. So this is so I, I hear this. So I read this question. So is Victor saying that commodities have never exchanged at their values in any time in human history? So. I mean, what I'm saying, okay, what I'm saying is that the root and early state of society, which was a Smith's, okay, point, okay, Smith's root and early state of society, okay, as we can see in the, in the beginning of this quote, was not an actual existing period in history, okay? So, sure, capitalism wasn't developed from the very beginning to the point where it is now. So, capitalism obviously had to develop at certain, at certain stages, and, and, and Marx acknowledges this, okay, that ha capitalism had more, uh, let's say, primitive forms, okay, of production, and that capitalism had developed to the point at which he was at, and that it has continued to develop to the point where it is now, okay? But what Marx already noted, okay, is that it is obviously the case that in, in, in a developed capitalist society, it cannot be true that organic compositions of capital are equal between industries. And since this cannot be true, it cannot be true that direct prices are the ones that indeed serve as the centers of gravity of market prices because it is price of production the ones that do. But prices of production are still very close to direct prices, which is why we can say that they, in a sense, uh, indirectly affect market prices through prices of production. Okay, so labor values are still there and they are still very prominent. And this is why we see all the correlations and this is why we also see the, the data, the cross-sectional data on, on, on the deviations between uh, prices and values why they are very small. And this is what I'm saying, okay? Because of course, at any given point in time, of course, it, it, it is not true that all commodities exchange according to their values, directly proportional to their life, to their values. Okay, this is not the theory. The theory says that they converge to this point and that in, in, in the capitalist societies where we live, where there are different organic compositions of capital between industries, they converge to a point which is the price of production. And the price of production, very close to direct prices. Okay, I don't know how many times I can explain this. I just want to make one quick remark before we continue. Uh, I noticed that Lord Keynes is very specific to point out that Keith never claimed so-and-so throughout this conversation. Um, I will proffer instead that Keith never, never claimed anything. I think this script is more or less entirely the product of Lord Keynes' work. And I think this because in, his, in Keith's response to the academic agent, I wrote the part on Marx. 
just FYI. So and you see Lord Keynes here is quoting Engels. Yeah. But but okay, by quoting Engels, you're not uh, quoting Marx. Okay, these are no. different people. Yeah. Different people that had actually different opinions in certain parts. Okay. Yeah. And by way of explanation, Engels. I had the I had the naive idea that by inputting some reasonable gloss on actual political philosophy that that would have some kind of positive influence. Clearly that was incorrect. And it seemed in any case harmless to give somebody a correct account of Marx's view of politics, but we'll continue with this one. This. Since hunters usually have different levels of skill and experience, and often success in hunting depends on luck, the hunting time for any particular animal caught could vary considerably. It is simply unclear why hunter-gatherers would have to determine exchange value in any such way, when labor time could vary to a significant degree, depending on each occasion which an animal is hunted. And for an empirical refutation of Smith's hypothesis, we actually have this. The famed economist Piero Sraffa examined this question in the late 1920s by studying the anthropological and, note and that historical Piero Sraffa literature. was, okay, a Marxist. This is a question that is highly contentious, but Peter Rafa was a Marxist. Okay? So, and he was actually in agreement with Marx, and you can read this directly from Rafa, on the proposition okay, that value aggregates are basically the same or very close to, price, uh, to the monetary aggregates, okay, to the price aggregates. So let's consider that, okay? because Peter Rafa was the one that set the basis for the modern developments of the labor theory of value. So when he's presenting here Peter Rafa as the defeater of the labor theory of value, this is an incorrect representation of the of the of what happened there. Sure of his day. Now we can't blame Smith for uh, not having access to this. Of course, this is anthropological data that was collected much later than Smith's time. But Sraffa put together works such as F. R. Elridge's Oriental Trade Methods from 1923, Carol Butcher's uh, Industrial Revolution, Raymond Furt's Primitive Economics of the New Zealand Maori from 1929, and E.E. E. Hoyt's Primitive Trade, its Psychology and Economics from 1926, and other works. And Sraffa found no evidence that time and labor played the fundamental role in determining exchange value in non-Western and less economically developed societies. I, I'm sorry to stop this here, but this is this is extremely frustrating to me. So the implication when you cite a book is that you yourself have read it to some degree and have determined that its contents support your argument. Keith has not done that here. Of course not, of course not. And you know what, like, uh, what Rafa, okay, so by pointing out the fact that in primitive societies where there wasn't a capitalist mode of production developed, that the labor theory of value didn't hold there, it is not a critique of the labor theory of value. And and here I see Lord Keynes saying that Rafa and Rafian theories of value uh, uh, set the basis for the critiques of the labor theory value that show that it is redundant and unnecessary. This is not true, and I show this also in my thesis. Okay, one of the one of the key problems that Rafa points out is that the that the that the path of prices as you change the profit rate, okay, can be very complex. And many people, okay, have taken the numerical examples, okay, of of Rafa and of other Rafians. Many Rafians have done this to say, okay. This okay, the nonlinearity of of the of the price paths, okay, and the complexity of the price paths, and of the out output to capital uh, uh, ratios and so on and so forth, okay. So the complexity of all of these, and this was also you know coupled with the critique of the neoclassical argument in capital, and it was you know uh, highly uh, this is part of the reswitching argument and all of this, okay. So this is highly complex, and I talk uh, uh, to some extent about this in my thesis, and what I show basically is that. And what other papers show basically is that empirically, and Rafa already knew this, but many Rafians forgot that part of Rafa and focused only on, on, on purely toy numerical examples rather than the empirical data. Okay, what they show is that the empirical data, and Luigi Passinetti, by the way, pointed this out as well. Okay, that that we need to be careful, okay, with with uh, talking about the numerical examples, because actually the empirical data might show that the the path of prices and so on and so forth can actually be far more simple and linear than it is theorized. Okay, so what they show, okay, is what the empirical evidence shows is that those Sraffian critiques do not hold true. They would hold true, and they do hold true for certain numerical examples, but they do not hold true for the data, for the empirical data. And this is something that Laura Keynes is probably not familiar with. 
because I show this in my thesis, and many other papers have shown this, including including uh, uh, and Ward Shaikh in his last book, and in another paper that he recently wrote. Okay. Well, then I am so, doubly excited for the fact that he's agreed to debate you at some point in the next month. Yes, because Rafa was not okay the, the 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 destroyer of the labor theory of value, and many Rafians have claimed to be the destroyers of the labor theory of value via those arguments that had a lot to do with the reswitching argument. Okay, that was an argument that was presented to critique neoclassical theories of capital. Okay, but in reality, the data shows that they are not correct. And something that I do in my paper is show this empirically for the Spanish economy for the years 2010, 2015, and 2016. Okay, so here Lord Keynes is wrong yet again. Primitive exchange was actually based on social relations more so, magical or symbolic worth of objects, uh, subjective utility, reciprocal satisfaction, ceremonial exchange, and conceptions of fairness. But there doesn't seem to be any strong correlation between labor time and the value of things that were exchanged. Now, of course, Marx's own formulation of LTV was more developed than Ricardo's or Smith's. So it's worth looking at some quotes from Marx himself on his own conception of the LTV. Quote, the value of a commodity is determined by the total quantity of labor contained in it. Commodities as values are nothing but crystallized labor. The unit of measurement of labor itself is the simple average labor. A use value or useful article, therefore, has value only because human labor in the abstract has been embodied or materialized in it. How, then, is the magnitude of this value to be measured, plainly by the quantity of the value-creating substance, the labor contained in the article? The labor, however, that forms the substance of value is homogeneous human labor, expenditure of one uniform labor power. So from these quotes, and uh, again, this is dealing with Marx's first treatment of the LTV, the conventional Marxist understanding. It's not, it's not of the first, the okay? It's the same thing. It's the same thing, but at an earlier stage of development, okay? And, and he keeps repeating this thing, but it is not true, okay? It is not true. It is not the first, and then there are more, okay? It is the same, but this is so one analytical stage, and then there are subsequent analytical stages. But I already repeated this so many times. Yeah, well, again, crucially, like the capital was planned out. The Grundrisse is is a plot for capital. He and, knew and, how and many I, volumes he was going to write. Yes, and, and let me just say one thing again. So here Lord Keynes is saying that the empirical data and correlation of labor costs and prices are fully compatible with the post-Keynesian theory of pricing and all non-Marxist cost-based th theories of pricing. This is not true, once again, not true. Because the Marxist theory of value presents specific hypotheses and, and the, uh, the empirical correlation okay, of labor costs and prices is one, but there are more, and those are not compatible with other theories. And this is something that that uh, uh, socialists on the left presented to me, and I already responded to that. And I said, okay, there is, there are these particular empirical uh, uh, questions that the labor theory of value poses, which is the cross-sectional hypothesis, which is the one that the price of production are very, going to be very close to direct prices and to market prices, and the direct prices are going to be very close to market prices too, okay? There is the time series hypothesis, okay, that changes through time in prices are going to be explained by changes through time in, in, in labor values, and there is the structural hypothesis, okay, which was tested by a mathematician from the Corant Institute of Mathematics at NYU. Okay, which is the hypothesis that the disturbance factor is going to be small even in the face of very big shifts, okay, very big shifts in the distribution of wages and profits. Okay, and this is a specific prediction of the labor theory of value of the Marxist labor theory of value and of the Ricardian uh, earlier version of it that is also been shown to be empirically correct. Okay, okay, so this is Ricardo saying this, but this is not the same for all other cost-based uh, theories of prices. So Lord Keynes is one second wrong. One second wrong. And yes, I have heard of the cost-based markup theory of pricing, and it is actually not uh, well supported empirically and in other and in other accounts, okay? But this is not what we're discussing. Hey, Keynes, and you these should, theories you, and these predictions are yeah. different to those. Keynes, you should save it for the debate next month. You're going you're gonna to show your hand well in advance. Volume 1 of Capital... Uh, 
we can put together uh, Marx's labor theory of value that goes something like this. Number one, the substance of value is abstract, socially necessary labor time, which must be defined as a homogeneous unit capable of aggregating and measuring all heterogeneous types of human labor power. Number two, therefore value is abstract, socially necessary labor time embodied, crystallized or materialized in commodities. And number three, the magnitude of value or quantitative measure of value is the amount of abstract socially necessary labor time counted in homogeneous units. Or to put this more simply, one, the average price of a good will be proportional to the average amount of socially necessary labor used to make it. Two, the value added in an industry will thus be roughly proportional to the labor it uses. And three, price is thus the indirect representation of underlying quantities of human time. I mean, indirect representation, some... I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put it that way, but, you know. Well, I mean, he... But, I, I, but, I don't want to, I, I don't want to nick pick too much, you know. No, 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 fair <laughs> enough. Well, I mean, we're halfway through, so I'm not that scared anymore, unless you have another 10-page document to go through. But um... <laughs> <laughs> maybe I have, maybe I have. Oh, I, I believe you. But I mean, I mean, again, like, just, just conclude that sentence with unless, and then you have volume three some bad arguments against the labor theory of value which are commonly found among Marxism's detractors and which unfortunately uh, fill Marxists with an undue sense of confidence in this because well the arguments that they encounter are just so See, bad. This is the thing okay this is what and they're doing there they're trying to say oh yes yes there are this all, all of these very bad arguments against the labor theory of value but we are presenting the good ones that is not the case they are just staying at the level of memes it is what I was saying, because there's no contradiction between volume one and volume three. And this is the, the best that they have provided is the is the assumption that is mistaken, that there is a contradiction and it's Rafa critiquing Adam Smith's rude and early state of society. That, that is the best that, that they have provided so far in refutation of the labor theory of value. And what is going to come next, it's not going to be any better. So... <sighs> I'm I'm going to I'm going to throw him one more bone uh Victor. Lord Keynes asks if volume 1 is just assuming organic compositions of capital are equal in all industries as a quote unquote simplifying assumption why did Marx never say so in volume 1 and why was Engels unaware of this? Yes because it's not as, as simple as that. It is not a simplifying assumption. It's just not considering that question until volume 3. And Engels wasn't okay so so this is important to give into consideration because Engels was in, 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 in close contact with Marx in many in many uh, ways and he understood a lot of Marx, but Engels wasn't okay completely aware of every single thing. And the fact that he wasn't able okay to get some of these questions right is is proof of this, okay? That Engels was not okay Marx, that Engels was not the same thing as Marx. That Engels was a different person who had in some instances different opinions with Marx, okay? The fact that they were friends and they were in close connection to each other doesn't mean that Engels is the best representation of Marx. He's treating this sort of like the problem of the succession to Muhammad. Like the, the, again, the fact that there are debates about this doesn't invalid because, anything. Because you know, Marx, Marx already already pointed this out in in volume three. He pointed this out. He said, "Okay, now let's go to the question of whether or not organic compositions of capital are equal between different industries." And when he touches that question, he realizes that this implies that there is a different, uh, that there is a different uh, determination of, of the form of value than the one be, that, that he presented in volume one. That's because he included that particular specification. But in volume one, he doesn't need to say that, okay? Because in volume one, he's not even considering that question. The same way that uh, a, a Newton, when he's considering the question of whether or not two bodies fall at the same rate, uh, at the same speed, okay, he's not yet talking about the about the fluid through which they are going yeah. through and that's why he doesn't need to say okay this is just a simplifying assumption he's just presenting that and, and there's also the, the style of of that particular time okay of marx okay that's the different style maybe an economist today will not do that in the way of marx and maybe they will present in a different way and that is certainly how i presented it in my thesis okay it was very clear from the beginning uh, that this is the case but marx had a different presentation style 
So this is not a question of why Marx didn't say that this is a simplifying assumption because he doesn't need to say it because it's obvious in well, his writing. Yeah, again, the issue is he has contempt for Marx. Like there's and no way not a around simplifying it, so. assumption. If you have contempt for someone, you're not going to actually do your due diligence trying to refute him or, or making sure that his work is actually, you know. It's the same, the same that Bomba work did, for example. Yeah. Uh, Marx already I'm, I'm saying, yeah, him. like I, I know what I'm talking about. I haven't read Bomba work. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. And yeah. and here Orkin says, a lie. Marx already discussed different organic compositions of capital in volume one. Okay, so so again, this is the this is the the, the, the important thing is Marx is developing and he considers certain things, but he doesn't develop them until further. That's why in his notes in volume three, he talks about okay, the the first step of the transformation procedure, and he gives us a hint about what the second step is, which is to feed back the effect. And he says, and he says, and he and, and the quote is something like this is but this problem needs need not be considered further uh, for now. So he's going to consider it later on. But we don't have writing of what he considered uh, this procedure to be. But he said, I'm going to consider this in the future. And this is what he said. But this is not a lie. Okay, what, what why, I said why a lie? lie? Yeah, why exactly. is it a lie? Like, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, you, you have clear mastery of this material. You Did you go to university for and, and travel to different universities and do your thesis for god knows how many years to lie i mean maybe Keynes did i don't know and they usually come from dismissing the theory without really looking at what marx argued that's why i'm being very careful to formulate this very clearly and succinctly very analytically because the most common kind of argument against the labor theory of value goes something like this uh, it's to point out instances of goods like an autograph sports jersey or an expensive piece of art and to point out that the price of these goods bears no relation to the labor used to produce them now this is a poor criticism of marx's theory because marx's theory applies to the equilibrium prices of reproducible commodities labor is meant to serve as an anchor of prices rather than you know an exact determinant of each individual price so again marx's claim so, is so that there's this theoretical yeah. So, so at least he's understanding that there are, there are criticisms that are worst, okay, which is good. But his criticisms are not, are not any better, okay. So I didn't say that Marx uh, never even considered in Volume One of Das Kapital different organic compositions of capital. I said that when he's developing, okay, the concept of prices of of direct prices in Volume One, he's abstracting from this fact. Doesn't it doesn't mean that he doesn't even even have in his mind this concept in volume one because when he wrote volume one he already had that concept in mind because he already knew what he wanted to say in volume three when he wrote volume one okay so it is I didn't say that okay I didn't say that it seems to that. me that so if much I said that, and, yeah. and it's an important thing that I didn't say this okay but even if I said it, it doesn't deny anything that I presented so far in favor of the labor theory of value. Well, I'm, I'm trying so like, to think even of... Even if he's trying to get that dunk, yeah, yeah. which is I'm, not I'm, even a dunk, I'm it, trying it doesn't to think even of... serve anything for his own argument, you know? Yeah. I'm trying to think of what besides a critique of, of hypocrisy or incompetence on Marx's part this argument is supposed to supply us with, because it doesn't... Let's assume for the sake of argument that there was actually a contradiction, that Marx didn't actually satisfactorily carry out in Volume 3 what he was doing in Volume 1. Okay, and like, like, what, what, what is, what is the point here? That doesn't invalidate volume one. That points to a contradiction in Marx's work. Maybe Marx made an error. That doesn't mean that the initial theory is incorrect. Yeah, but Lorcan's here. I mean, I, I never said. Okay, I never said that volume one is completely ignorant of different organic compositions of capital. That Marx in volume one doesn't even consider that uh, at all. Okay, I just said that Marx, when developing the labor theory of value in volume one, is not having that particular thing uh, as, as a strong feature of it because he knows that he's going to present it later on. Like many other things that he says, okay, this is true, but I'm not going to discuss it right now because I'm going to discuss it later on. And I presented the example of the transformation procedure. Okay, but this is not a dog. Oh boy, did you. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. And even if it was, and even if it was, it doesn't debunk what I what what the argument is. It doesn't debunk the argument, which is what we are discussing. Unobservable, which should coincide with uh, the equilibrium prices of commodities, or it should be an anchor for 
prices, average prices of commodities. And it should explain the relative prices of them in this equilibrium state. Marx believes that this unobservable is the amount of socially necessary labor time crystallized in the commodities. So to finally deal with this argument as Marx presented it, first of all, the idea that exchange value fundamentally depends on quantities of labor expended in production of commodities is not self-evident in the way that Marx presents it. In fact, the argument for the first premise of the labor theory is not supposed to be self-evident. It's not supposed to be self-evident. It's just supposed to be an argument that presents a case for something. Whether it is self-evident or not is irrelevant. The only important thing is whether or not the argument successfully does what it attempts to do. And this is what I'm going to defend now, but but it doesn't matter whether it's self-evident to him or not. Because self-evidence is also a relative property, okay? Different yeah. people have different senses of what is evident. So, it do, so saying, oh, I don't think this is self-evident is not a refutation of the argument. But again, yeah, depend, depending again on like how much respect you have for the material at hand. Like imagine somebody doing this with a, phys with a physicist or something. It's be a non sequitur. Uh, let's take a look at what I mean with this quote from Marx. He says, quote, let us take two commodities, for example, corn and iron. The proportions in which they are exchangeable, whatever those proportions may be, can always be represented by an equation in which a given quantity of corn is equated to some quantity of iron. What does this equation tell us? It tells us that in two different things, there exists in equal quantities something common to both. The two things must therefore be equal to a third, which in itself is neither the one nor the other. Each of them, so far as it is exchange value, must therefore be reducible to this third. So Marx actually takes it as a given that if there is an equilibrium price that two different commodities exchange for, that there must be an unobservable third something uh, to which both of them can be measured quantitatively and by which they can be shown to be equivalent. This, for Marx, is value, but this is not supported with any evidence here and does not follow from anything. Can you, can you stop it right there? So this is a complete misrepresentation of what is going on there. Okay, what is going on there, what is going on in, in Marx in the beginning of this capital when he's discussing, okay, the, and this is the other meme that I said, oh, Marx didn't explain how this was. Okay, Marx did explain why this occurs, how this occurs, and he had a very nice example talking about the area of a triangle. Okay, now, now let, let me let, let me make this clear. Okay, so when Marx is talking about commensurability, his point about commensurability is that in the market, okay, we see that things get exchanged uh, uh, between each other, okay, and that this exchange value is a relative property because you can express it in many different forms. Okay, you can express the exchange value of, uh, let's say, uh, a, a piece of wood in terms of iron, in terms of rice, in terms of uh, corn, in terms of many other commodities, in terms of all other commodities, actually, because in the market, those commodities are commensurable. And what he's getting at there is that the property okay, of all of these commodities okay, that, that explains these exchange values, first of all, needs to be a social property. Second of all, needs to be a quantifiable property because those exchange values are themselves quantifiable. And now I'm going to be showing you because he's actually going to give now a refutation of uh, I don't know if he knows this, okay, but but now he's going to give the grounds for what I consider to be a very strong case against the subjective theory of value, okay. But but even before I get there, what I what I want to say is that Marx, what is what he's getting at there is the fact that in the market, the commensurability of commodities implies, okay, that there is a social property there that all of these commodities have in common and that they and that they represent a higher or a lower quantum of, okay, and that this social property is labor, okay? That it is best described as labor. And it is not just concrete labor, but abstract, socially necessary, direct and indirect labor times, okay? This is where Marx is getting at, right there. And what and what he says, okay, is that this reduction, okay, to a, to a common substance, to a common social substance, is a reduction that is done by the market. It is not done by economists in their heads. Yeah. It is done by the market. 
Okay. Mar the market compares quantitatively commodities. Okay. And, and in this comparison, we see that they are reduced to something that they all have in common and that this something is a social property. In other words, this argument is a non sequitur. So there is no non sequitur. In fact, there. not only does there not need to be this third something that Marx postulates, which is common to both commodities in an exchange, there doesn't even need to be an equality of subjective utility. Rather, See, that's when the, one... Uh, okay, that's that's what, we, what he's going to say right now. There doesn't need to be an equality of subjective. Uh, and Marx already understood this, and he said this, okay? He said, the reason why producer of producer A, okay? Producer A, let's say, produces commodity X, and producer B produces commodity Y. What Marx says is producer A exchanges, okay, let's say, one unit of X for one unit of Y, because they see in, in, in Y, they obtain utility from Y that they didn't obtain from X, and the same goes for the for producer B, okay? So when this exchange happens, Marx notes, there is, as it were, uh, however you want to measure this, okay, an increase in aggregate utility, okay? Because the utilities were unequal. However, and Marx notes this, both producers are still in the position of a commodity that is worth the same in the market, okay? So let's say that commodity X, one unit of commodity X is worth $10 and one unit of commodity Y is worth $10. And note this very, very carefully because this is a really good point against the subjective theory of value, okay? If these two are worth $10, okay, when exchange happens, both producers have gained in utility, but they haven't gained in exchange value. So one substance has increased and the other one has remained constant. What does this mean? That utility and exchange value are categories of different order. Okay? And that therefore one cannot explain the other. Mm. However, both still have a commodity that is worth the same in the sense of value. Both still have a commodity, okay, under this uh, uh, theory, that has the same abstract socially necessary direct and indirect labor time embodied in if, for the production, okay? So what this means is that whereas they both have gained utility, but they haven't gained in exchange value, they also haven't gained in value. So in the market, if they were to take those commodities back to the market, they still have the same value that they had before but not the same utility because both have gained in, in utility. Once again. Mm. And this is a really strong case that Marx already pointed out for why utility is not the substance of value. So Keith here is actually giving us a reason why, and Marx already pointed this reason, subjective theories of value cannot work okay? because they cannot explain social properties and they cannot explain why there is this reduction to a social common substance because of this particular phenomenon. Because utilities are unequal and they are subjective. Person exchanges one good for another. It seems likely that in most cases he values the good he receives more highly than the good he gives up in the trade. And the same can be said of the other person at the trade. And that is really all that is necessary to explain commodity prices. I know another problem that many have identified with the labor theory of value is that it is metaphysical or mystical. No. <laughs> it's clearly wait, wait. Hey, hang on, hang on. I want to see if he just stops here. Just just wait. First of all, Marx faces the problem, as mentioned earlier, of reducing all heterogeneous human labor to a homogeneous, abstract, socially necessary labor time unit, but does not properly explain how this happens. This leaves open the problem of assessing labor of different degrees of skill in terms of a unit of what he's calling simple labor. But is there really a way we can equate the value of uh, unskilled labor of various degrees of effort and working conditions and so on yes. into this? Yes, we can. Uh, let me just say this. Let me just say this about, about this particular point. Okay, so this is a question that has been uh, given, you know, a lot of thought, and and that it has been brought about, you know, a lot by by critics of the labor theory, party, which is the question of uh, skilled and unskilled labor. Okay, and there are different ways of treating this subject. 
Okay, there are different ways of doing this, but homogenization of labor values, okay, the homogenization of labor values is also something that is done by the market. The same way that the market abstracts from what makes uh, labor concrete, because, okay, this abstraction is in a sense represented by the abstraction of what makes a commodity useful, okay, when, when we're considering exchange, okay, in the same way that, that that abstraction occurs, the abstraction of labor values also occurs, okay, of labor times so of words. And then there's the, the homogenization of these values. So what we can do as economists is estimate this homogenization, okay? And there are different ways of estimating this. And the one that I used for my empirical testing and the one that, that is also used in, in different papers is one where you take basically a, a, a given set of what you can call multipliers, okay? You can call them multipliers. So what you do is you take, okay? You try to estimate, okay? The, you, can, you try to account to put it in a better way, you try to account for the differences in skill across industries, okay, across the labor of different industries in the following ways. You take the minimum wage in that economy, in uh, so the, in, the the wage of the minimum the minimum wage of all of the of, of all of the industry, and what you do is you divide, okay, you take the ratio of each wage to the minimum wage, and you multiply that that ratio by by the labor values by the labor coefficients. And what you get is the homogenized labor coefficient vector, okay, of that economy. And that is the one that you use in order to compute, you know, the price of the, the direct prices and so on and so forth, okay? That is the one that you use. Uh -huh. So in this way, what we have done is we have homogenized the labor coefficients, okay? But this is something that we are, are in a sense, estimating. But the market is the one that does this in reality. Exactly. The market I was, is the I one was... that abstracts from all of this. What we do is we try to measure it. The same yeah. way that we try to measure height, but height already exists before we measure it. The same way that the homogenization already is done by the market before we measure it. There are different ways of measuring it and there are different, there are better ways, okay? And, but I, and, and the way that I did, for example, may be improved upon, but there are indeed ways of treating skilled and unskilled labor within this theory. So this is not like something. But the only thing is, you know, the people that are just trying to get easy dunks on the labor theory of value, okay, they just point out certain things that, sure, maybe there needs to be more specification of something. And then they say, okay, and this completely invalidates everything, and that's why we don't need to consider this anymore. But when correct me true, if I'm wrong. The, the true position here, uh, even before, like, like if I can just finish this, Please. but the, the, the true scientific procedure here is not to say, okay, uh, maybe the, this thing needs to be specified more. Uh, uh, therefore, we have to completely get rid of everything. That is not the correct position, scientifically speaking. The correct position is, okay, this is something that maybe we need to take into consideration uh, more thoroughly. So then the question mm. is, how can we do this? And can this be done? The question is not, the, the answer is not, okay, then let's get completely rid of this. Okay? But that is only what the people that are trying to get an easy dunk and leave the, the, the field the battleground, that is what they try to do. Get an easy dunk and leave the battleground. But the true scientific procedure here is to say, okay, maybe we need to specify more on this particular question. How can we do this? And can this be done? Okay? Can it be yeah. done at all? And if it can be done, how? It is not, okay, let's get rid of everything. But they just want to get a very simple reason to get rid of everything. And the second they see one, they they do it and they get and they try to get rid of everything. That is not that is not how it works. Okay, that is not the honest uh, way of going about this this subject. Right, uh, you want to say something? Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but when he's talking about the average socially necessary labor time, that right off the bat, like I, I, again, like it's not a question of whether or not there is some metaphysical property of value within every individual instance of labor. Rather, there is an average of the labor time it takes to produce a given commodity. And then that is sort of, um, that is crystallized in the market. It's like, I think this is actually covered in, in volume one and I'm like, where is this? Oh, I had it a second ago, but it's gone. But yeah, like, like, as soon as you start bringing in averages, it's actually, it's it's kind of an immaterial question whether or not there are, again, divergencies of skill. Because you, again, that, that will... Yeah, that, that, will that, is, that, that is within an industry, okay? Within yeah. an industry, okay, the producers that take more than the average don't produce more value. They're just being more inefficient. 
but between industries, okay, we can conceive of differences in skill between industries. Mm. And and the way we account for those is by the method that I that I talked to you about by the multipliers. But th that not that doesn't need to be the, the, the only one. Okay. We can we can devise more and we can improve upon that one, but we already have ways of doing that, okay, empirically. And this can be actually dealt with, okay? We can deal with this topic. But by pointing that this is something that we can uh, discuss more, you don't refute what was said before. You're just pointing out something where we could, in fact, give better solutions or, or more solutions. But we already have certain solutions and we already have a way of accounting for this. So, yeah. so don't pretend like what he's saying here is, a debunking of anything because it isn't okay it isn't a debunking of anything this one homogeneous unit this is a kind of it is, mystical it is conception. Like an argument from ignorance okay like, like to put it this way i don't know how this works therefore it's wrong no okay that's an argument from ignorance it is not an actual way of proceeding scientifically and logically okay you just say that uh -huh. okay fair enough and, uh, any kind of empirical datum but perhaps more importantly marx never explains why human labor should well, have can you stop really? because I, like i'm reading over... lord Keynes here and, and it is really really annoying uh he says that victor is admitting that socially necessary labor time uh cannot be accurately measured i'm not saying that I, actually it can be measured and it can be measured accurately through input output tables and that is what i did and that is what what the empirical studies do okay they measure Abstract, socially necessary, direct and indirect labor time. So, so, what is Lord Keynes even arguing here? Like, I, I don't really know because, know. and all that he can do is guess about phenomenon he assumes is already true. No, no. We have... we input output tables, you can in fact calculate this. I mean, like, I can, I can, like, if he wants to, if if he wants, if he wants to, I can send him my thesis. Like, he can give him, he can give uh, me his email hey, or something, um, and I can send him my, my thesis Victor. and all of the other papers. You said you have the night free, right? Yep. Yeah. Keynes doesn't seem to be busy. Does Keynes want to come on? You don't have to use your voice. I'll read it out for you. You can just type in private chat. I'll give you I'll give you a minute. You can make a decision. Because I can show him how you calculate labor values with input output tables. No. No dice. If you want, we can we can finish this and then let him let him respond. Yeah, uh, Lord Keynes, if uh, if you want to come on after this, we'll we'll try to wrap up fairly efficiently, and um, we can just I can facilitate a conversation between you and Victor. No problem. Say machine or animal labor. In claiming that value is embodied human energy, that human labor and only human labor produces value, Marx's labor theory of value... Okay, so we have a response here. So Lord Keane says, I can send you messages on Twitter to read out. Here's what I suggest as an alternative. I give you a StreamYard link. You keep yourself muted. You post the arguments into the private chat, which you will see in the uh, studio when you come in, and I will read them out. And I will make sure that Victor doesn't interrupt me. Oh, you want to send them in Twitter? God damn it. Why does it have to be Twitter? All right. If you want to send me them in Twitter, um, the issue is, is that I'm going to be reading them out in real time. And uh, <laughs> so that's that's going to be a bit slow. I'm happy to do it, though. We can. We're already two hours in. I have no problem with uh, holding my breath a little while longer. But you know what? Screw it. Yeah, if you want to, uh, if you want to start sending me the messages on Twitter, DM me, and I will read them out, and Victor can answer them in real time. We'll say, uh, we'll say usual rules. Give an opening statement, um, two five-minute responses. I'll give you some time to write them, of course. And uh, same with Victor, and of course, we'll forgo the open discussion. Let's uh, finish this video though, and then we'll get to that. Does that sound good, Victor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds perfect. Cool. There is a difference between this and uh, private messaging and Twitter in that if I have you in the stream yard, I can just see them like that. I don't have to switch between windows, but that's fine by me. We can we can work with that. 
actually veers into the mystical again. This specific criticism was noted by the economist Piero Straffa, who wrote, quote, there appears to be no objective difference between the labor of a wage earner and that of a slave, of a slave and of a horse, of a horse and of a machine, of a machine and of an element of nature. It is a purely mystical conception that attributes to human labor a special gift of determining it is not, value. It is not uh, a mystical. This is a capitalist it's entrepreneur. Sorry, repeat that. It is a social property that we're talking about, okay? Here, okay, when we are talking about the difference between the labor of a slave or, or, a, or, or a wage earner, okay, maybe the concrete, so maybe the labor is the same. But socially, the relations are different. The context of that labor socially is completely different. And that is why those labors are different in socially. Although maybe, maybe you know, picture the same work, okay, the same form of labor done by a wage earner and a slave. Maybe you can say, okay, they are the same. But in reality, they are not because the relations of production that both uh, represent, that both entail are completely different. And, okay, and, and this is the question, okay, what about the, the, the labor of animals? In the video that he's going to present right now, again okay, in this in the in the video clip, is lies the answer. Okay, so so keep keep playing it because you're going to see the answer to this question about the labor of animals in the video itself. Who is the real subject of valuation and exchange make a great difference whether he employs men or animals? Does the slave owner? And Karl Popper also noted this problem of LTV, writing that quote. The strange thing about the value theory is that it considers human labor as fundamentally different from all other processes in nature. For example, and the it is, labor and it is. of animals. Uh, continue, continue playing it. Okay. You're going to see right now the, this is the, the solution. You're going to see it. The good question for Marxists that subscribe to LTV. Why is animal labor excluded from this? Animal labor was a big part of the economy up until very recently. So, and stop still it, is stop many it, stop parts it. Stop it. Before we start, so the question is, why is animal labor excluded from value? Can you see anything in the screen yeah. that gives you a hint at why animal labor is excluded? <laughs> I didn't even catch that. Well, good job. Can, can, can you give a can, can you get can, can you get like a sense in the screen of what is going on in the screen right now? Of oh, the it's answer? because the it's it's because the human labor is wearing pants, of course. Exactly. It's because there is a human that is controlling what the animals are doing. Because the animals by themselves don't produce commodities. Yeah. And they don't distribute commodities. It is humans that do these things. It is like saying, it is like saying, okay, so... so, so I think more importantly, they also don't enter into employment contracts. Um. Exactly. Animals don't enter into employment contracts. You know, they are not wage earners. So then the question is, why is the, the labor of animals not to be uh, considered analytically here? Because animals are not social entities in this in this concept, okay? And this is not some some kind of analytical chauvinism. What it is is just saying that human labor is the social property that we're looking for because animals themselves don't produce for exchange. It's only humans that do this. And in the screen, he's already presenting the answer to this. There is a human right there, controlling what the animals are doing, the same way that there's a human controlling what the machines are doing today in, in, a, in a modern factory, you know? This is the answer. Yeah. And he has it in his face, but he doesn't see it. He doesn't want to see it. The world. And there's another absurd aspect of Marx's LTV. Since Marx regards surplus value as the source of all money profit, his theory logically requires that profit rates should be the lowest in those in, industries important, important with the highest labor right. productivity and the highest proportion of machines to human labor. An idea insanely contrary to reality. In the real world, these industries with little human labor and a high level of automation tend to have, generally speaking, higher rates of profit. And this is the exact opposite of what LTV would predict. Can you stop it? Okay. Yeah. Important, important. So first of all, he's pretending like this is an, a, a, a falsification of the of the theory, okay, in his prediction. And this is uh, he, this is a complete misunderstanding of what falsification is. Falsification is not okay. 
saying something and then saying, no, 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 no. But in my experience, I, I think that this is the case. Where is the data? Okay, where's the data? First of all, where is, where is okay, a systematic analysis of the predictions of the labor theory of value and the data in support or against the labor theory of value, okay, against this particular prediction. Where is it? Because I can show him studies where there is, in fact, found the link of increasing organic compositions of capital and decreasing rates of profit. I can show him the data that shows that this prediction of the labor theory of value is indeed correct. Where is his data, okay, to show that this is an, an incorrect prediction? Well, I think, if, if I may... Um... And, and actually, the, the relationship is far more complex, okay? And again, you can read Anwar Shaikh on, on when, when he discusses profit because there are many different uh, ways in which we can understand profit margins and profit rates. And there, there are many different other factors that go into this picture, okay? It's not just about capital intensity. Sure. Yeah, but, but at even the same the, the empirical patterns are in favor of us. But he doesn't present empirical patterns. He just says, no, 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 no. But I have my own idea about this. And I think that in the real world, this is not the case. Where's your data? Yes. Well, I'm, I mean, I, just, just, to, just to jump in there quickly, um, this is acting like uh, Marx doesn't talk about the use of shuttles in textile making in volume one. Like the, the result, again, is the devaluation of labor. It's not. It's not a contradiction to the labor theory of value. Obviously, the value of, of the, 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 the socially necessary labor time is going to be relative to the technology we're employing to, to, to do the labor. Yeah, but like he doesn't present any data and the data actually agrees with us. So then, you know. And furthermore, in the economic model of classical economics, which was highly influential in the 19th century when Marx was writing this, uh, market competition was supposed to create a tendency toward equalization of the rate of profit in industries with different ratios of capital to labor. So the idea is when capitalists are free to invest in any industry, there was supposed to be a tendency towards a general uniform rate of profit constant across all industries, regardless of how much any of the industries are spending on human labor. Yes. And you know what? This concept so okay, of the homogeneous rate of profit is accepted in almost all of the serious economic uh, schools to, uh, today and through history. Okay? Even in the neoclassical school, this is an accepted premise that profit rates get equalized across industries. And there is empirical evidence on this as well. And, and it actually... Okay, so there is okay, empirical evidence on average profit rates. Okay, And the empirical evidence on average profit rates is not indeed conclusive of this particular... Uh, a point, but there is evidence on incremental rates on profit, and there is other evidence that points towards this being the case, as well as, of course, the evidence on price of production being really close to direct prices, which is also to be considered here. Okay, so there are many different things to keep into consideration, and there are, in fact, certain studies like Zachariah 2006, okay, that present okay this concept of okay, there is lacking empirical evidence on the equalization of profit rates, okay, but those are isolated studies that are right there. Okay, but this is a, a more serious discussion, okay, that requires an entire stream just for that question. Okay. And, and even if you and even if okay, so even if you take down that particular assumption of the of the equalization of profit rates, the labor theory of value still has a lot of empirical corroboration, as Paul Cockshot, for example, who doesn't believe in profit rate equalization, shows himself. Okay, but profit rate equalization does indeed have empirical support behind it. Okay, and it is again an assumption that is highly accepted by almost all uh, serious schools of economic thinking throughout history. So let's keep into consideration this, although this is a far more complex question that requires a lot more, uh, uh, you know, talking. Okay, but yes, Zachariah 2006 finds that evidence against the equalization of profit rates, but profit rates don't get equalized ac uh, across their averages. Okay. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set a rule here. So I have told Lord Keynes that after we're done with Keith's video, I'm going to open up a second stream where we're going to have basically as close to a formal debate with one participant not there as we can. So he is. I'm going to give him until the end of this video to compose a roughly five minutes long opening critique, which I will read out. I will give him 10 minutes to respond. You'll get five because he has to write his out. I will read it for five minutes and then you'll have five minutes to respond again. Two alternating and then we'll finish. Sound good? Yep. Okay. No more talking to Keynes until we're done. <laughs> Let's go, let's go. Marx actually acknowledged this problem, writing that, quote, 
This law, meaning his law of value, clearly contradicts all experience based on appearance. Everyone knows that a cotton spinner who, reckoning the percentage of the whole of his applied capital, employs much constant and little variable capital, does not, on account of this, pocket less profit or surplus value than a baker who relatively sets in motion much variable and little constant capital. For the solution of this apparent contradiction, many intermediate terms are as yet wanted. So this is Mark saying that this is an apparent no, contradiction, this problem that not led, an actual sorry. contradiction. Okay, this is Mark saying this is an apparent contradiction, but it is not the same. So he's presenting this as if Marx was admitting that this is a contradiction. But Marx is saying this is an apparent contradiction, but there are more specificities that need to be included into the picture. Again, and Warshak talks about this as well. Okay. Uh, I don't even know what he's trying to do there because, okay, saying that this is an apparent contradiction doesn't mean that you believe that this is an actual contradiction that debunks your theory. But yeah. he's presenting this as, as if, look, even Marx didn't believe uh, he's in his own theory. Not true. Marx to revise his theory in volume three of Capital, leaving behind the conventional labor theory of value that he outlined in volume one, and instead adopting a cost of production theory that was used by older classical economists like Ricardo, as discussed earlier. So in conclusion, not only do we not have a consistent formulation of the labor theory of value, but Marx's own economic theory presented in volume one of Capital as compared with that in volume three, is inconsistent and can't actually be harmonized. In short, modern Marxists are in this impossible position where any attempt to defend the labor theory of value presented in volume one of Capital means that they have refuted the version volume three. No. And any attempt to defend... No. The I mean, it, it's just incorrect. TV in Volume 3 of Capital means that they have refuted the version presented in Volume 1. And that is aside from the deep issues with the very notion of something like labor value actually existing as Marx imagined, the impossibility of reducing all kinds of human labor to some homogenous unit, and the strange mystical it status given once. specifically to human... Yeah. So it is not impossible. No, He's just saying things here that are untrue labor over animal or machine labor. Marx begins the whole endeavor to prove labor theory of value with a non sequitur and fails to make any kind of convincing empirical case from then on. Later Marxists have attempted all kinds of reformulations and reinterpretations of the theory, but they fail for suffering the same fundamental defects as the original attempts. He's canvassed them all, of course. <laughs> yes, he knows. He knows what he's talking about. Yeah, exactly. He has gone through all of the Marxists and he understands all of the different uh, technical, uh, 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 you know, all of the different technicalities between the theories and so on and so forth. He knows what he's talking about. And that's why he can say this, even though he, in reality, has no clue. And what I he's mean, saying is, is untrue. Like, it is true, okay, that there are many Marxists, okay, that have gone wild on this topic and they have presented really bizarre uh, solutions or really bizarre theories uh, ever since. But once again, there this doesn't mean that there's a contradiction between volume one and volume three. This doesn't mean that there is no like uh, uh, empirical evidence that we can point to in order to support, okay, the law of value as developed throughout the volumes that we have of capital and, 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 and so on and so forth. Let's think of what we're being asked to buy here when you say something, when he says something like this though, right? Like think about the sheer volume of literature he is he is castigating by that not even by name just a genre like i to my knowledge keith does not have an economics degree um i i don't i can't even fathom having this much information under your belt having i i mean midway through to your economics phd like the amount of the amount of um again writing and data that he is basically pretending to have gone through is obscene and in the first video response like we it, it we saw very clearly he didn't understand any of these people's quotes in context and this is in a much more easy area of just general ethics um this is super technical i'm having a considerable amount of difficulty following it and i don't think i'm an idiot
I mean, I probably am on some level, but like, I'm not, I, <laughs> this is, this stuff is hard. It takes a lot, it takes a lot of time to, um, to become fluidly conversive, fluently conversive with, I think that made sense. Um, and I don't know, like what, what is, what is the point to this except just to, again, get in on a market for dumping on marks? Like it's, what, what is the upshot of this? Are, are people going to start looking into these writers and investigate it further? No, it's just telling people, hey, you, you know what, that, that story you were told by your parents growing up that communism is evil and Marx was stupid. Yeah, it's just, just leave it. Don't, don't bother looking, it's nothing here. That's, that's basically it. There's no educational value here. It's just, it, it's, it's just slander. Finally, we can see why Marx only ever published volume one of Capital yeah, this is the last meme. Lifetime and utterly refused to publish volumes two and he three. He refused. Look at this. He refused to publish them, not because they were incomplete, but because he knew that Carl, there was a contradiction. Carl, you got to publish volumes two and three. They're asking questions. And Marx is like, no, no, no. They, they cannot realize there's a contradiction. When I'm finished, okay, yeah. Despite many Marxists demanding that he do so. In fact, it took Engels years to finally publish Volume 3 of Capital in why, why would Why would it take Engels years to publish a book from the dirty and completely unintelligible notes of Marx? Okay. Shoot, this why doesn't make any sense. Think, years, Engels, yeah. think. <laughs> why would it take Engels so much time? Why, why would it even take Marx so much time to develop such a, a complex and, and, and rigorous and, and highly, you know, dense analysis of the capitalism mode of production. You know, why would it take him so long? It'd just be like, you know, like a couple of weeks. It's just, just an essay, bro. It's just an essay, you know? Okay. There are there are myriad examples that I could pull of texts written for ignoble reasons. Like, let's say Scientology. You ever open up a book of Scientology, even before, and I, I'm sorry, I'm nerding out about this because I love this crap. Um, even before um, Miscavige started like dumbing it all down and removing all of the content, when you open them up, the line, the margin, the the spacing is is wide. The actual text is short. Why? Because the entire purpose to a con like that is to make money without putting in the work. Okay, this <laughs> this is not a get rich quick scheme. It's it, and for the record, like Engels was already wealthy. What would be the point? Yes. So let, let me note here. There's a question that says from Robert Evans that says, "So did Engels write the book from Marx's notes?" So Engels compiled, okay, from Marx's notes, volumes two and three. The only volume that Marx got to finish fully and publish was volume one. Uh, do you know off the so top Engels of your didn't head? didn't write them the, himself. Yeah. It's like he compiled it from the notes of Marx. Right. Now, do you know off the top of your head? Because obviously, I don't think he was starting from nothing. I think Marx had started compiling volumes, at least volume two himself. Do you have a sense of how much of that was already completed before Marx died and how much of that was taken up by Engels or no? Again, like this, this is a compilation. It's, it's like when uh, Tolkien's children compile Tolkien's notes, right? Like it's still Tolkien's work. It just hadn't been put into publishable form yet. Like all, all I can tell you, and this is pretty much what anyone that is an expert on, on Marx, uh, 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 I was hearing before from Michael Henrich, you know, uh, what, they, what they all would tell you is basically that Marx wouldn't have published them in the state that they were. And that's why he didn't publish them in the state that they were. Now, I don't know exactly how close he believed he was to, to full completion of those volumes, but he surely wouldn't have published them in the way they were. And there probably would, would have needed to be a lot more uh, to those because if you compare not only like the content, but just the writing style and everything between volume one and volumes two and three, especially volume two, which is, you know, unintelligible in many respects and really dense, okay? You will see that that it is, you know, undeniably true that Marx would have included things and he would have probably, you know, made things far more elegant and far more, you know, cohesive, like, like in volume one. Yeah, which, by the way, like, his unwillingness to, despite demand, despite, by the way, his relative poverty and dependence on Engels financially, despite that, to not just do that himself and push out volumes two and three and four and five and six, and, and that's, that's Marx having standards. That is a good thing. Exactly. 
you know, and Marx studied so many things and he had so many projects in mind that it's also, you know, not very surprising that he didn't get to finish what he was doing because he even wrote a full book on, on calculus, you know. He wrote he wrote on, on almost everything and he studied almost anything. He was studying, you know, Russian by, by himself just to be able to understand some of the data that was coming from Russia in order to get certain patterns for some studies of, of the agricultural system there. You know, it's like yeah. he studied so much, so many different things, and he was engaged in so many different things that, of course, he didn't have time to finish what he wanted to do. Uh, he, he was he he didn't just do economics either. Like he did like an, an immense everything. Uh, an immense critique, a very good critique, by the way. Like I disagree with some of it, but a very good critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. Um, he he did, of course, extensive critiques of all the young Hegel. Like this was this was somebody on a, easily on a tier with Kant and Hegel himself. No, no, I mean um, like, you don't understand. Like like Marx was at a level of education. So every, every like every I think I think it was every year he would read all of the all of the classical. Uh, I don't know if it was all, but like a, a fair deal of the classical Greek, you know, uh, uh, literature and, yeah. uh, and like the just in, in ancient Greek, okay, just to refresh his memory about it. Like, well, just imagine what that is. Well, I How don't many even know people Greek. Today speak ancient Greek or Latin. No, but uh, that's not that's not the right he, question. He hang on, hang on. No, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna amend that a little bit. The right question is how many people speak ancient Greek. And Latin, um, and German, and, uh, and, and Italian, and French, and English, and wait, and, and wait, and in addition to that, have like a have a masterful command of world affairs. Like this man did not sleep. Um, That's why all of those memes, you know, about Marx didn't take this into consideration or that. You know, if you're talking about a, a person, okay, of that level of of academic rigor, you know, if you think that he didn't take something into consideration, it's probably you being wrong. Okay, it's probably you've been wrong. Yeah. And, and in 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 one percent of the time, maybe it's you getting somewhere. You know, like oh, oh my god, maybe maybe this is actually true, and maybe I can improve upon this. Okay, but you need to have the level of understanding. Like I'm not even uh, uh, cl close to that yeah. level. Okay, of the, of the kind of people that would actually you know be at the level enough to say Marx didn't take this into consideration, and this is the way in which you should proceed. Okay, so when you get people like this who clearly never had any formal engagement with anything, okay, surrounding this topic, speaking with so much arrogance about these topics, it just drives me nuts because these people don't have the authority to make those claims. Well, they don't. I mean, but yet like they have all of the confidence. Yet they have all of the confidence, and that's true for Lord Keynes. That's for sure. Well, people in this sphere will absolutely complain all the time about their arguments not being taken. Uh, not being taken fairly or critiqued fairly. It's it's like <laughs> I don't know. I I just I don't even know what what you get out of this ultimately because again, like if, if the goal is like we're again we're not talking ultimately about somebody who has carefully gone through Marx and has seen glaring contradictions and has wrestled with them and just can't reconcile them. We're talking about someone who has largely been fed snippets from elsewhere um, of works that he has spent practically zero time ingesting, uh, compiling them all together to make a product. And it's like, this is embarrassing. Like your name's on this. Like granted, I've said embarrassing things in this stream because I'm a know nothing when it comes to economics, but like you're, you're slandering someone who dedicated their life to this because they thought that there was something valuable they could give to the world through it. It's bad, you know. And, and what is and what is worst is that he's taking his opinions from people who didn't even have a better approach to the question. They just wanted to get easy dunks on Marx in order to to present alternative theories uh, that actually are far worse than than even the the, the worst interpretations of, of the Marxist theories. And they wanted to get the easy dunks to ignore as much as possible these questions. You know. Yeah. All right, let's finish this up because we uh, we have a debate with Lord Keynes after this. So that's going to be interesting. Apparently, we're doing this before you go on your trip, so that's going to be cool. Even though people were pressing him for it, it's likely that Engels dragged his feet and must have been very apprehensive indeed about the publication of Volume 3, since Engels knew that in Volume 3 of Capital, Marx had used a different theory of price determination uh, with his prices of production model which he totally contradicted 
you know? Repeat that. Keith lives in Engel's mind. He knows exactly what Engels was up to. He's an expert in Engels. By the way, Engels wrote a lot too. His books were also thick. And dense. And dense. I mean, like, good God, this is this is one. This is one part of one books Marks one books. One book Marx wrote. The Labour Theory of Value in Volume One. When Engels published Volume Three, the inevitable happened. Hostile critics of Marxism and even some sympathetic supporters of Marx pointed to this devastating contradiction between the two volumes. Engels scrambled to rewrite history and defend <laughs> Marx. Finally, in his supplement and addendum to Volume 3 of Capital, published in 1895, Engels defended Volume 1 by saying that the law of value there only applied to the pre-modern world of commodity exchange, before prices of production came to dominate modern capitalism. But this, as we have seen earlier, is itself actually refuted by modern anthropology. I am 100% certain, not even a doubt in my mind, that everything from here to the conclusion is written by Lord Keynes given to Keith in a document, because this is not how he talks. No, 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 because this is exactly what Lord Keynes was saying in the comments, written almost exactly from a, like from a script. You know? Yeah, yeah. If you enjoyed okay. this and video, please. It's done. done. <laughs> it's done. Two hours and a half. We're That's done. your. That is your fault. Oh my God, you're gonna scare uh, so many people away. That's fine. <laughs> I'm actually gonna. I'm gonna cut that. I'm gonna upload that separately. You should too, actually, um, because that is gonna be immensely valuable and is basically impossible to ingest on one viewing. But that's great because that's actually the talk you gave to me the other day, and I had to pretend like I was following along after about thirty minutes. <laughs> no, no, but it was it was that was really good. Um, all right, so uh, put that in your pipe. We, and we smoke warmed and up, right? We we warmed up for the debate. <laughs> oh yeah, God! I mean, my bladder is definitely warmed up for the debate. I have to go to the washroom. Um, so I'm just waiting on uh, Keynes's uh, responses. I think what we'll do is we'll close this stream. I'm going to open up a second one. And we'll do the uh, we'll do the debate there, okay? Okay, like like should we uh, answer like uh, answer questions in the comments? No, or? and I'll tell you why. Because we've gone for two and a half hours. I want Lord Keynes to actually send me his statements, and we can answer questions at the end of the following debate if Lord Keynes wants to. And actually, I will give Lord Keynes the opportunity to answer some questions as well. Now, there's going to be there is a caveat here. Lord Keynes has. Um, understandable concerns about not wanting to dox his voice. So I will be reading out his statements and his responses. So his responses will be slow. So I'm giving him an, basically so double your time. That, uh, somebody says in the comments that the link to my channel doesn't work. I'll, I'll update the link to your channel in the uh, in the description. I, I might have been okay. using it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that, but I'll, I'll check into that. Um, do you want to oh, plug okay, yourself yeah, before no, we go? No uh, Victor, yeah, tell I mean, people about your channel so before we go to the next thing. Sure. So, so my name is Victor Magariño. Uh, my channel has the same name. Uh, you can write Victor Magariño as in the, as is written in, in the screen uh, in my little box. And uh, I hold a degree in economics and one in philosophy from NYU. I do a lot of content on classical and Marxian political economy, also on philosophy. And uh, I'm also starting a series on the mathematical foundations for classical political economy, so so that people that are not too familiar with the mathematical concepts uh, applied to economics and to the classical school in particular uh, can get, you know, uh, at least some level of understanding of this concept so that they can defend the theories and, and they can see for themselves some of the arguments and some of the empirical evidence. And uh, yeah, that's basically what I do. If you want to support me in YouTube, uh, you can support me in Patreon, you can follow me in Twitter and many other things. Great. And in Discord, in the cathedral. Yeah. Uh, oh, yes. And we also we uh, we share a Discord server, same uh, as well with uh, Zanzi and a host of other very interesting philosophers. So join us there as well. Um, very interesting group, much smarter than me. So, all right, um, let's give ourselves about ten minutes. I will reschedule. I will schedule rather the debate for about let's say fifteen minutes from now, and then we'll uh, and we'll do it. Yep. I didn't sign up for this. All right, join us again in 15 minutes and uh, we will be 
watching and semi taking part in a debate between Lord Keynes and Victor Manorino. Take care. <laughs>